Well, it, it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thewlis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. This, uh, in the proper way, uh, in a considered way, we're using evidence and it's uh, a robust policy position we've arrived at. We've um, not chosen to push forwards without checking with communities and indeed science uh, with unconventional oil and gas extraction despite um, the pressure from outside. And I would certainly recommend to the UK government as essential reading the extensive evidence base we have now gathered on unconventional oil and gas and which our decision today to not support fracking is based. And that evidence is all to be published on the Scottish Government website and will be available to anyone who wishes to use it. But I may be tempted to send a web link to my colleague uh, Kwasi Kwarteng in the UK Government just to make the process easier for him. Thank you. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, there must be an SNP party conference coming up soon because here we have yet another statement on fracking. It has taken six years for the Scottish Government to come to this position. This follows nine reports into fracking, four consultations and a court case costing the taxpayer £175,000. After all of this, can the Minister clarify whether today's statement amounts to a legal prohibition on fracking, an extended moratorium, or is it just more PR gloss? Minister. Ah, I could have predicted this one would come yeah. up, and indeed we did. Um, um, this is obviously a process, as I've said in my statement, it's, 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 um, there's certainly aspects of the process which uh, I appreciate communities and industry will have been frustrated by the length of time to get to where we are, but they are governed by statute and have to be done in the statutory process and therefore take time. So we've taken the appropriate time over the last two years since I gave my statement in October 2017 to do what Parliament asked us to do in the motion that we passed on 24th of October 2017, and that is to undertake a strategic environmental impact assessment and a business regulatory impact assessment on the preferred policy position, and we have now finalised that position. Today's announcement marks the conclusion of that process, uh, which we've taken towards the development of our policy. It has ensured we have reached a policy decision that is fit for purpose, which enables us to set a framework for the exercise of planning functions and our functions in respect of onshore oil and gas licensing, which arrived after the statement I gave in October 2017. And under this policy, we would not, have been issuing, uh, not be issuing a licensing round for new underground uh, unconventional oil and gas uh, uh, production. 
But I would emphasize a point in relation to the language that, that Dean Lockhart mentions. Um, he would be well aware of the court action he referenced himself in his question, that language is extremely important. We are trying to respect the determination of Lord Pentland and the inner house of the court session uh, and not put at risk the process which we have taken very care, great care to reach today. And uh, I would encourage the member, that's, that's what I'm going to say about language. We have been very particular in what we have put in the statement today. I appreciate it may not be as exciting as some statements can be on occasion. It may be um, a, a case of uh, campaigning in poetry and governing in prose, as I've said previously, but we have had to put the language down in a particular way to, to give clarity to the policy position so all stakeholders, whether they are for or against unconventional oil and gas, know exactly where we stand. And I'm confident we've done that today. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, Senior Officer. Uh, Senior Officer, clearly opening up any new fronts in fossil fuel extraction is bad for the climate. And can the Minister therefore outline what plans that he has to build a low carbon, decarbonised energy system in Scotland? Minister. Absolutely. Stuart McMillan uh, raises a very important point. I'm sure it's a matter that, that all of us care about in this chamber. Uh, we have published in December 2017 Scotland's energy strategy, which sets out a target to deliver across not just power generation but across heat and transport um, the energy we need for 50 percent or more of it from renewable resources by by that milestone and uh, that's extremely important now oil and gas industry as i've referenced earlier uh, has a role in, uh, in that transition we are trying to work very hard with the oil and gas uk oil and gas authority and and operators to ensure that we achieve uh, a net zero solution center for the industry and to try and ensure that they achieve their roadmap uh, to 2035, which is not insignificant. It's 15 megatons of CO2 they want to save in terms of the production process itself. And we are clearly uh, pushing on at, uh, at, with some uh, vigor on our pursuit of renewable energy in Scotland. I'm delighted to say in the last year for which we got figures, 76.3% of Scotland's electricity demand can now be met uh, for, by renewables. And we saw 1.2 gigawatts of new capacity installed in 2018 to 2019 alone. So we're seeing continued investment in renewables driven by a strong policy position from the Scottish Government and the support of the industry. Claire Baker to be followed by Gil Patterson. Um, thank you, President Officer. I've been campaigning for a position opposing fracking in Fife and in Scotland since 2012 and today's statement is very welcome. Uh, my understanding is that there are two issued licences in Scotland at the moment. How does the government plan to manage these licences? And what does this mean for the relevant planning authorities? And can I just ask for clarity, the new planning directive which is due to be issued, is that imminent? Is that in the next few days? Yes. Um, I believe uh, just on the latter point that was to be issued as soon as I sat down, um, but I can confirm that. Um, obviously, we didn't want to preempt the, the statement, but that will be issued today. Um, so uh, planning authorities will have that. Uh, as I mentioned in response to Mark Ruskell, the, the, currently the two appeals um, that, uh, that are, are assisted, um, now that the policy position I've outlined today is finalised, um, the DPA, the Department of um, uh, Environment and Appeals, will, will um, write to parties seeking their views on whether any additional or updated evidence will be required before they submit their report to Scottish Minister. So effectively, they will take stock of the position today see if there's anything changed since the appeals were assisted in terms of evidence based from the applicants and then we'll proceed uh, to uh, Scottish ministers will then make final decisions on these appeals. So that's, that's the appropriate mechanism to go, go down that route um, and I hope that's helpful. But I'm happy to discuss the matter with Claire Baker if that's helpful and I do recognise her own strong interest in this area. Gil Patterson to be followed by Jimmy Halker Johnson. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Minister, recognising that the licensing of fracking was previously a reserved matter, when the Liberal Democrats pushed through the fracking licensing and that the MP for part of my constituency in Eastern Dumbartonshire received £14,000 from a director of a fracking company, would he agree that Joe Swinson, who professes to be against fracking but actually voted for it, should hand back the frackers' money and tell the frackers to frack off? Minister. I, I probably need to be careful in how I, I respond to this question, presiding officer. Um, I, re I recognise you probably have an interest in that as well. Um, what I would say in terms of Ms Swinson's voting record issue, I very much recognise 
that she has been inconsistent on this issue. And I think it will be for the voters of East Dumbartonshire to take their view on that in due course. And I'm no doubt Gil Patterson will, will highlight that. Um, but we, we certainly uh, do recognise that, um, uh, that there are, there are uh, inconsistencies in parties' approaches, but I, I'm confident that um, I'm sure Liam McCarthy will have a consistent position on this and um, being against fracking, as I know he has, but um, it's for Matt, others outside this chamber to answer to their own actions, presiding officer. Jimmy Halter johnson to be followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you. In 2016, the Scottish Government commissioned an economic impact assessment into unconventional oil and gas extraction, and this strong and detailed piece of work demonstrated that there would be many potential benefits to Scotland if extraction could take place here. Among them, it highlighted a potential £4.6 billion in gross value added to our economy, over 3,000 jobs, often in highly skilled professions, and £3.9 billion in tax receipts. So can I ask the Minister whether he still recognises those figures, and will he accept that his Government's decisions will come at a very high price to our cost to our economy, to jobs and to Scottish public spending. Minister. Um, I, I have to uh, admit I, I disagree with the premise of, uh, of the question um, in this respect, and I, I will deal, deal with why. Um, certainly in terms of the economic impact study that we had commissioned from KPMG, the central scenario, which is thought to be the most likely one, taking out of planning constraints and the likelihood that not all sites would be passed by planning, uh, £2.2 billion of spend in Scotland uh, would be uh, the, the figure that we recognise in terms of additional economic benefits of 1.2, so it's 2.2 billion of turnover, 1.2 billion of economic benefits in Scotland up to 2062, so over a very long period of time, approximately 0.1% of GDP on an annual basis, and supporting at peak 1,400 jobs in the economy, and that's including the supply chain and uh, indirect effects. So with uh, cumulative additional UK tax receipts of 1.4 billion over the period up to 2062. So I would just put it to Mr. Halko Johnson. I appreciate the position he's coming from is a disagreement with us, but that he may be overstating the economic impact of, of a potential industry in Scotland. And on his latter point, I mean, I would also emphasize the cost of mitigation of the climate emissions that were identified by the UK Committee on Climate Change, which would be at the very least in that scenario, same scenario, uh, 0.4 megatons additional emissions annually, even with the strongest regulatory environment in place, that would have a cost to mitigate. And therefore, you have to set that against the relatively modest economic benefits, the, uh, the considerable costs that would come to mitigate those kind of emissions. I'm sure he will be familiar with the kind of figures we're talking about in terms of implementing the climate change plan. Richard Lyle to be followed by Neil Finn. Thank you, President Officer. So there's no doubt and certainly no fudge as some in the chamber suggest, can the minister confirm that unlike England, Scotland will resist fracking to the best of our ability? Minister. Absolutely. Uh, we, um, obviously, within the bounds of uh, planning policy, uh, I can't fetter the actions of further uh, ministers down the line, and I've outlined to Claudia Beamish the need to enshrine in NPF4 our policy position. Absolutely, Richard Lyle, we can guarantee that we, we are, we've taken a robust evidence approach, and I can confirm to, to Richard Lyle that since onshore oil and gas licensing power was devolved to Scottish ministers in February 2018, and as a consequence of the moratorium, on unconventional oil and gas development introduced by the government in 2015, no fracking has taken place in Scotland, and the policy, the finalised, robust policy we put in place today, will certainly uh, enshrine our policy now, and we will, that will be uh, used in processing any planning applications that come in. Neil Findlay to be followed by Colin Beatty. Um, the experience of the Public Procurement Bill shows that reliance on regulation and statements of policy intent without legislation these policies open to having a coach and horses driven through them, and I believe this could potentially happen with this bill. The government has faffed about with this for about seven years. Um, why won't we just take clear and decisive action once and for all and simply legislate to ensure that fracking cannot and will not take place in Scotland? Minister. Well, um, I, I think um, Neil Finlay, I'm not saying that this is his characteristic, but he's being a bit mean-spirited today in terms of the... Um, the approach uh, that, that we have taken. We have taken time because we needed to take time to do the, the evidence, gather the evidence, assess the evidence, consult with the public. 60,000 responses to our ta a talking fracking consultation. We've had to do the statutory process and the strategic environmental assessment required by the 2005 Act, which was actually put in place by Labour and the Liberal Democrats in, when they were in power. So we're actually following through with the legal requirements of this government to get to where we are today. And he may be aware, uh, I'm not sure if he is, but he may be aware his colleagues in the Welsh Government have actually relied on the evidence we've gathered to form their own policy in Wales. So we've actually had a benefit for others. And we're keen to share it with England as well. So I think, um, if, if I could just put it to, to Mr Finlay, I recognise there's a concern, there's always a concern about whether policy will stand up to scrutiny 
in the test of time. We're willing to work with other parties, including Labour, to make sure this policy position is robust. But I believe what we have put in place today using our devolved planning powers and our licensing powers we now have since February 2018 is robust. But if we need to, we will work with others in this chamber to make sure it's more robust still. Colin Beattie. Presiding officer, does the minister share my astonishment that the Scottish Government has repeatedly been criticised for taking advice from a wide range of independent experts, for pledging to, pub to publish that advice in full, and for promising to give the people of Scotland a chance to make their views heard? I think, I think uh, presiding officer, Mr Beattie's question is, is very well timed, given what we've just heard um, from, for, uh, from Mr Finlay. As I've outlined a number of times now, we, we have taken a robust evidence-led approach to finalising our policy on unconventional oil and gas. We have considered evidence gathered from a range of independent experts, undertaken the necessary statutory assessments, and we have ensured that people in industry across Scotland have had the opportunity to participate in the policy-making process in a constructive, inclusive and transparent way. We are aware of the strongly held feelings on all sides of this debate. That may give us an extra responsibility to do this carefully and in a considered way and to listen to all voices. And it's only right that we've then considered all those submissions that have been provided. And I'd like to take this opportunity once again just to thank everybody who's contributed to our policy process, not least members in this chamber, but others uh, outside clearly in the communities that are affected, industry partners as well, and to recognise the considered submissions that so many have made to this process. Thank you very much. And that concludes our statement on Scotland's un onshore unconventional oil and gas policy. I'm going to move on to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions, which I trailed earlier, on justice and the law officers. Our first question from Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government how many fire stations have been supplied with PET oxygen masks by the organisation Smokey Paws. Minister Ashton. Uh, Smokey Paws is to be commended for its work in raising awareness of the safety of pets in fires and in fundraising to provide the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service with specifically designed oxygen masks. 251 of these pet oxygen kits have already been handed over to stations across Scotland, with another 25 in the process of being distributed to SFRS local senior officer areas. These 276 kits have been supplied to the fire service through donations made by the Smoky Paws charity by individual members of the public, firefighters, animal charities, dog walking groups and a range of companies, uh, including several veterinary practices. Thank you, Tom Arthur. I thank the Minister for her response and updating Parliament. My constituent, Ron Ewing, was at the forefront of the Smoky Paws campaign in Scotland, uh, coordinating uh, the operation of Smoky Paws in Scotland, co-coordinating it, visiting countless fire stations the length and breadth of Scotland to hand over the pet oxygen mask kits. He was also an enthusiastic member of the CPG on Accident and Prevention and Awareness, convened by my colleague Claire Adamson, as well as a former chair of Johnston Community Council. He was also a friend, and he is in many respects responsible more than anyone else for the prevalence of the oxygen oxygen kits across Scotland today. Sadly, Ron passed away during the summer recess after a short illness. Does the Minister agree with me that Ron's legacy is one that his wife Carol, his family, friends and community can be proud of? Minister. I, I certainly would and uh, my thoughts are with Ron's family and friends at this time for their sad loss. Uh, Ron clearly was the driving force in introducing these kits to the SFRS and he spent a large part of his time supporting their delivery, travelling the length and breadth of Scotland. And his passion and his dedication will be remembered and his legacy will continue as Scottish firefighters use the oxygen therapy kits in their line of duty. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the percentage change has been in the number of recorded crimes in North Ayrshire over the, past, over the last decade and how this compares with the national figure. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. The latest national statistics show the number of crimes recorded in North Ayrshire fell by 36% between 2009-10 and 2018-19. This represents a reduction of just over 3,300 crimes. Uh, over the same period, recorded crime fell 27% across the whole of Scotland. Kenneth Gibson. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee has criticised the UK Government's ability to tackle organised crime, including human and drugs trafficking, drug dealing and cyber crime, and suggests it looks to Scotland for answers. How is organised crime being tackled in North Ayrshire and across Scotland, and to what extent is this reducing crime uh, in our communities? Cabinet Secretary. One point that uh, Kenneth Gibson uh, raises, you'll probably know that chair, the serious organised crime <coughs> task force and partners on that serious organised crime task force, uh, of which Lord Advocate also uh, attends, uh, continues to take forward a range of activity to reduce the harm caused by serious organised crime in North Ayrshire and, of course, across Scotland. Um, this effort is supported by the state-of-the-art facilities at the Scottish Crime Campus in Gatkosh and the collaborative approaches it engenders, uh, which law enforcement colleagues elsewhere across the United Kingdom look at with great uh, envy. In fact, as the evidence in July this year to the PAC inquiry into serious and organised crime at Westminster, the Chief Constable of Merseyside Police said that, and I quote, there are a lot of good things happening in Scotland that we should keep a very close eye on. So from a Scottish Government perspective, we're very keen to, of course, continue that effort uh, against uh, serious organised crime, uh, human trafficking, which uh, Kenneth Gibson mentions, and where we can share information, of course we routinely do, but where we can share good practice uh, with forces and other partners across the United Kingdom, uh, we're always happy to do so. Liam Kerr, to be followed by James Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, not only has violent crime risen for the fourth year in a row to the highest level in seven years, but clear-up rates for violent crime has now dropped to the lowest level in eight years. More robberies, more serious assaults, and fewer of the perpetrators being brought to justice. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any answers to that? Because it doesn't seem so. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it's easy for anybody, particularly Liam Kerr, to pick out any statistic in any given year. But the longer term trend is what you want to look at. Longer term trend shows that violent crime has reduced drastically 43% uh, over the last decade, recorded crime fallen by almost a half over the last decade. And let's contrast that with the Conservatives over the last decade. Uh, of course, you're more likely to be a victim of crime if you're an adult under Tory run. England and Wales. Uh, that's probably because they've cut 20,000 officers, where we've, of course, increased officers by over 1,000. So I'll take no lectures off Liam Kerr and the Conservatives on how we have to deal uh, with crime, with law and order in Scotland. And of course, uh, uh, I would say to him, uh, if he is serious about tackling this issue, he should look at the underlying causes of why some of that crime uh, violent crime has risen in the year. We know that, for example, part of that is to do with operational uh, reasons uh, in terms of uh, stop and searches for drug possession. So we are serious about uh, reducing crime. That's why we have such a good track record over the last decade and just over a decade. Uh, and it's something that Liam Kerr and his Conservative Party could learn from. James Kelly. One of the areas that's causing concern in terms of the recent statistics is the rise in crimes of a sexual nature, which has gone up by 8% and is at the highest level since 1971. And in local areas like Glasgow, where it's gone up by 9%, and South Lanarkshire, where it's gone up by 20%, uh, that has caused real anxiety. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does he recognise the serious issue and the challenge presented by the rise in crimes of a sexual nature, and what specifically the government are going to do to tackle this issue. Cabinet Secretary. I can thank James Kelly for uh, that question, a very serious uh, subject and, and, a, and a really important question to ask, and, and I appreciate the tone in which uh, he asked it as well. Uh, some not too different to what I said to Liam Kelly in respect to it's important that we look at long term trends, and long term trend over the last eight years has seen a rise in sexual offences. So uh, there's a number of reasons underlying that. Uh, just a few examples and a few reasons. I should say, of the underlying uh, reasons for those, that growth in, in sexual offending. Uh, one is we know that a number of those cases uh, are historic sexual offences, so we would hope that, that would mean that people have more confidence to, to report. Uh, we know that uh, from having talked uh, to a number of victims' organisations and so on and so forth, there's more we can clearly do around that confidence, but there is a greater confidence we feel to report. Uh, more worryingly, uh, I would say, uh, we've seen the rise in the use of technology uh, for sexual offences and sexual crimes, uh, cyber-enabled uh, sexual offences, and even more worryingly, perhaps, than that, uh, is, is, is the number of young people and young people offences that we see of a sexual nature. And on that front, in order to answer James Kelly's question direct, that Dr Catherine Dyer has done an incredible piece of work looking at that particular element. Uh, I think her report and her final report is due uh, very shortly uh, with us, and of course I'll update James Kelly uh, and the Parliament in due course once we have that report. Thank you. Question number three, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government how many convictions 
for vicarious liability have been made under provisions in the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, up to 2017-18, uh, the latest date for which information is available, there have been four prosecutions involving relevant charges brought under the Section 18A of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, and those have resulted in two convictions. One person was convicted of four charges in 2014-15, and another person was convicted of two charges in 2015-16. Thank you. A vicarious liability was presented by the Scottish Government in 2012 as a strong response to raptor persecution and civil society welcomed the provision and had high expectations that it would be effective. However, it's clearly the case that there's no indication that raptor persecution rates have been positively affected um, and as the Cabinet Secretary has said, there have been very few convictions. Why have there not been more and does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the time is right for an urgent review? Thank you. Secretary. What I would say to Alison Johnson again, it's an incredibly important uh, question uh, that she asks. In terms of why there's only been uh, two convictions uh, for vicarious liability since 2011, there's a number of reasons uh, why it may not be appropriate to pursue, pursue a charge of vicarious liability. For example, in common with other crimes, uh, there are evidentiary thresholds that must be met before a case can be brought. Uh, COPFS must also consider whether it would be in the public interest to pursue a uh, conviction. She will, of course, uh, be aware uh, of the recent bill uh, that was introduced, uh, the Animal and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Bill. Uh, that, while that doesn't create new offences, uh, it will uh, look to increase the maximum fine in prison term that a court can impose on those found guilty of vicarious liability. In terms of uh, raptor uh, persecution, which she mentioned, uh, I think the member will be aware that we established an independent group to examine how we can pursue uh, that grouse moor management is sustainable and compliant with the law. Uh, that review that's led by Professor uh, Werity is due to report in the coming weeks. And again, I'll ensure that the appropriate minister keeps uh, Alison Johnson updated on that progress. Claudia Beamish. Officer, um, landowners, of course, have a direct responsibility for what happens on their land. With only two convictions for vicarious liability, can the cabinet secretary clarify if it is not or it is indeed legally necessary for there to have been a charge and successful prosecution of the perpetrator of a crime against our wildlife in order for a vicarious liability charge to proceed if the evidence of the crime is compelling. Thank you. Again, maybe I can uh, get more detail to Claudia Beamish about uh, the, the exact uh, dependencies uh, of the law, but it would be, uh, as I said to my question to Alison Johnson, uh, there is a range of factors that have to be considered uh, in terms of pursuing a, a charge of vicarious liability. As I said, evidentiary thresholds uh, about a case being brought, but also it's for, it's for the Crown Office and Procurator for Fiscal Service to consider whether it would be in the public interest to pursue a conviction. That is for them. Uh, and I know uh, she, she is saying, I think, from, from, from a position that uh, it, it often is, but that is not something as just a secretary uh, I can interfere in. Uh, that decision rightly lies uh, with the Crown. But uh, I take the points that Alison Johnson has made. I take the point that Cla Claudia Beamish uh, has made. And I will uh, uh, certainly uh, see if I can get more detail on the specific uh, question that Claudia Beamish asked and, and write to her more detail. Thank you. Question four, Rudy Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to protect families who have been affected by domestic abuse. Minister Ashton. The Children's Scotland Bill was introduced on the 2nd of September and a key aim of the bill is to further protect victims of domestic abuse and their children in family courts. In particular, the bill restricts the personal conduct of a case in proceedings uh, involving vulnerable witnesses, ensures that special measures to protect vulnerable parties are available in child welfare hearings and establishes a register of child welfare reporters, which will ensure reporters are appropriately trained in domestic abuse. Uh, the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act of 2018 creates a specific event of domestic abuse and it reflects that children are harmed by domestic abuse by creating a statutory aggravation in relation to children and enabling the court to use a non-harassment order to protect children as well as the adult victim in the offence. The Minister acknowledges the harm done to children who are subject to domestic abuse, whether they have directly witnessed it or not. But yet the civil courts continue to give parental rights and access to abusive parents. The abuser often continues to control and abuse 
their victim using that right? Will the Scottish Government legislate to ensure that an abusive parent no long, will no longer be granted these rights? Will they ensure that no victim of domestic abuse is faced with the horrifying choice of sending their children into an unsafe situation or they themselves facing arrest and jail for contempt of court? Minister. Um, I thank Rhoda Grant for raising this, what is a really uh, serious issue. And we are aware that some perpetrators of domestic abuse may seek to lodge repeated court cases uh, regarding contact and residence in order to continue uh, the domestic abuse. So we propose to make regulations under section 102 of the Court Reform Scotland Act 2014 in relation to vexatious uh, behaviour in contact and residence cases. And this will allow the Court of Session, the Sheriff Court or the Sheriff Appeal Court to make an order in relation to a person who has behaved in a vexatious manner. But there are also a number of provisions contained in the Children's Scotland Bill um, which aim to put the child at the centre and also to protect uh, uh, victims of domestic abuse and their families. Thank you. Question five, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact a presumption against short sentences will have on female offenders in Scotland. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. National statistics show that around 90% of custodial sentences for women are for 12 months or less. Many of these women will have experienced abuse, mental health or addiction problems, or indeed a combination of all three at some point uh, in their lives. Short prison sentences do little to rehabilitate people or reduce the likelihood of reoffending. And we know that they can disrupt families and adversely affect employment opportunities and stable housing, all of which evidence shows support desistance from offending. The presumption is not a ban and decisions about sentencing are a matter for the independent court. Uh, however, the extended presumption is intended to help enable a further shift to community-based interventions where appropriate and is expected to positively impact on women in the justice system. Impact will be monitored closely, uh, including in relation to the impact uh, on the female population. Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, a recent um, report um, from the Ministry of Justice um, called the Economic and Social Costs of Reoffending Analytical Reports showed that there was a societal cost of £18 billion a year in the UK. Given this, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Scottish Conservatives in this chamber, as well as the new Government Justice Minister, Robert Buckland, should get behind this, this um, project and get beh behind the presumption against short sentences to the benefit of the whole of society? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I would, I would agree with that uh, sentiment. I've often said that my approach uh, to justice and evidence-based approach, that was clearly also the approach that was being taken in terms of short sentences by uh, Robert Buckland's predecessor, David Gawke, uh, and indeed his junior minister, uh, Minister for Prisons at the time, uh, Rory Stewart, who I know was thought of well uh, in terms of some of the members of the Conservative benches. And David Gawke, in his last speech as UK Justice Secretary, stated, and I quote, that whether through prison community sentences or fines, offenders must face justice. And justice works best when punishment and rehabilitation are balanced and the cycle of crime is broken. Let me be clear. I don't want to see softer justice, I want to deliver smarter justice where offenders serve sentences that punish, but also make them less likely to reoffend. end quote. And because we know the economic and social cost of reoffending is significant, and we know from evidence that short custodial sentences are not as effective and not effective at rehabilitation. The extended presumption against short sentences is not a silver bullet, of course, but it is an important reform as part of an evidence-led progressive approach to reducing offending. Lee MacArthur. According to HMIPS, the number of women held in custody on 31st of March 2019 uh, was 380, as it was at the same time uh, 2018. Given the new female custodial estate is due to accommodate 230 places, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary offer uh, that not only will the new prison and community custody units be completed in 2020, as promised, but that the female prisoner numbers will be in line with capacity at that stage? Well, Lee MacArthur does uh, raise uh, an important uh, point. Now, the hope is that, of course, the presumption against short sentences has an impact in reducing uh, that female uh, custodial uh, population. Uh, but also, he might well be aware that at the moment, as things stand, there is also capacity in other prisons uh, to hold females. That is not the position that we want. We want uh, our new CCUs uh, plus the new national facility to be able to hold our female custodial estate. But, of course, there are 
uh, other places where capacity would be found if needed. But that is not the, that is not the intention. The intention is that hopefully PASS reduces the number of women in our female custodial uh, state uh, and, and, uh, uh, and indeed uh, the, the CCUs uh, and, and the new national facility holds uh, will, 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 be, will be fine in terms of capacity. But uh, if we need uh, to look at other uh, parts of the prison estate, uh, as we currently do, uh, to hold females, then of course uh, there is that capacity uh, should it be required. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In its recent uh, report, Audit Scotland suggested that the presumption would reduce the prison population by just 200. Given that we are 5% over capacity, what other measures is the Cabinet Secretary considering to either reduce the prison population or indeed increase capacity? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I don't want to do the latter. If I can give the, the, the member that reassurance, I don't want to increase capacity. I don't want to be uh, a minister who is uh, building additional uh, prisons, of course, uh, new prisons to replace the ones that were closing down, but not additional prisons. Uh, the answer very much lies in the, former, uh, the first part of his question, uh, which is how do we reduce uh, the numbers that are coming in? So, yes, the presumption he's right will have uh, an impact, and that impact maybe will be around two to 300. Uh, where I'm really keen, and I know Daniel, Daniel Johnson has uh, an interest in this, what I'm really keen to do is tackle the population that is in remand in our prisons, and I think bail supervision will be a large part of that. Uh, the management of offenders uh, provisions, some of them will commence uh, later this month in just a, a few days' uh, time, actually, uh, and then we can look further at some more bail supervision measures. So tackling remand will certainly be a part of that, uh, investing in community justice alternatives so that sheriffs have confidence in those measures will be a part of it. But there is not, as Daniel Johnson's question alludes to, one silver bullet, one panacea that will help us with that. It will have to be a whole range of measures uh, for which, of course, uh, we are uh, absolutely determined to take a very evidence-led and progressive approach. And question six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, and I refer to my register of interest as a member of Unite the Union to ask the Scottish Government to what extent the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service works with the University of Glasgow's Forensic Toxicology Service when responding to drug deaths. Lord Advocate James Wolfe. I'm grateful to Monica Lennon for that question. Um, all sudden, unexpected and suspicious deaths in Scotland are reported to the Crown. Where the death may be drug-related, the Crown instructs toxicological analysis of samples obtained at post-mortem examination. Glasgow University currently provides this service under contract with COPFS, for deaths in the east and west of Scotland, with NHS Grampian providing a service for the north of Scotland. In cases of this sort, toxicological analysis may be essential in order to establish the cause of death. Monica Lennon. Thank you for that answer. When we have a drug death emergency, there should be no disruption to a vital service, which does deal with 90% of all cases of toxicological analysis. Can I ask the Lord Advocate, can he guarantee that there will be no gap in provision or knock-on delays of the current contract with Glasgow University ceases early next year? Lord Advocate. Um, it's perhaps uh, important that I put the uh, current situation um, with that contract in, in, the, in its context. Um, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is engaged in a project which aims to improve across the board in the provision of pathology, mortuary and toxicology services, quality of service delivery, affordability, transparency and value for money. Um, in the course of negotiation with Glasgow University in that context, the university intimated that it does not wish to continue to provide toxicology services in the longer term. Um, the Crown has had constructive discussions with an alternative provider with a view to transfer of this work from Glasgow University and COPFS anticipates that assuming these discussions reach a satisfactory conclusion, staff will have the option to transfer to the new provider. Uh, COPFS is working with the alternative provider on a full assessment of future service requirements uh, uh, as well as the management of transition. Um, no contract is yet in place, so I can't, I'm afraid, give, uh, uh, say more at this stage. But meantime, I'm pleased to be able to say that Glasgow University has confirmed this week that it's willing in principle to extend the toxicology contract to the end of September 2020 with a view to the work uh, transferring thereafter to an alternative provider. Um, this will help to minimise disruption to this essential service and will, I hope, give reassurance to the uh, staff involved. 
I, I should like to make clear the significant contribution which the pathologists and toxicologists at Glasgow University and elsewhere make to the investigation and prosecution of crime and the investigation of deaths and the value which I attach to that work. And um, uh, senior Crown Office officials met with those staff last week to discuss their concerns and to set out uh, next steps. Thank you. And Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. It's very sad to have confirmed uh, what I already knew from a letter uh, from the university meeting with the, the staff there as well. But also in the letter I received from the Crown Office, it mentions National Forensic and Non-Forensic Pathology Service for Scotland, a creation of. Can I ask then if this new provider is the creation of National Forensic and Non-Forensic Pathology Service for Scotland? And will it be based in Scotland? Advocate. Um, thanks, Sandra White, for that uh, question. Um, the work that the Crown Office is engaged in in relation to these services um, has the long-term ambition of establishing a national forensic and non-forensic pathology service for Scotland with centres of excellence for relevant specialisms in different uh, locations. So, for example, the service has made progress on the establishment of a national neuropathology service, which will be provided by NHS uh, Lothian. Um, it's, we have a strong interest in retaining um, these services and the relevant skills uh, in Scotland and um, Crown, of Crown Office of Procurator Fiscal Service um, in the context of the work that I've described um, would uh, hope to um, retain the, that work in Scotland. Thank you and that concludes portfolio questions. I'm going to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 19218 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Can I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Thank you very much. And no member wishes to speak on this motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 19218 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes, yes we are agreed. Thank you. So the next item is stage three proceedings on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. In dealing with it, point of order, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, I sought to lodge two amendments to this bill, Presiding Officer, but both were ruled inadmissible. Um, this bill is about the criminal law of assault, and my amendments would have clarified the meaning and scope of the law of assault for the purposes of this bill. Moreover, they would have done so in a manner designed to give effect to and not to frustrate the stated policy objectives of those who have promoted and supported this bill. And those objectives are, of course, to bring to an end the physical punishment of children. The problem is that this badly drafted bill doesn't stop there. It goes much further, because in Scots law, an assault can be committed even if no physical force is used. So given that my amendments were in line with the stated policy objectives of the bill, and given that they were avowedly concerned with the scope of the law of assault, which is the subject matter of this bill, can I ask why were they ruled inadmissible? Can I, can I thank Mr. Tompkins for giving advance notice that he intended to raise this as a point of order. Uh, as the member may be aware, the criteria for admissibility are laid out in standing orders. Uh, at stage two, of these decisions are a matter for the convener. At stage three, they're a matter for me as presiding officer. Uh, the key aspect here of admissibility is that an amendment must be consistent with the general principles of a bill and it must be relevant to that bill. Uh, selection of amendments is a matter for me at stage three and I take a number of factors into consideration when reaching my decisions. So, uh, point of order, Mr. Tompkins. I'm, I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Um, Presiding Officer, I cast absolutely no aspersions on the motives or purposes of those who advised you about this matter. I have no doubt that they acted in good faith throughout. But I do have concerns about the effect of their advice and your ruling on this. As I understand it, Presiding Officer, although please correct me if I'm wrong, members of this Parliament have no means of challenging the advice of officials where, as here, we perceive that that advice is so narrow uh, to rule out amendments to legislation honestly believed to be directly and rationally connected to it. So can I ask you this? Are you content that our rules are appropriate in this regard, and do you think that they need to be reviewed? Thank you, Mr. Tompkins, for the point, and I, I am content. The, the rules are there 
uh, to make sure that matters for policy discussion, which the member has now raised and put on the record, uh, these are matters for the policy makers, which is uh, all of us here as MSPs, and they're not matters for debate between the chair and members. The chair has to treat everybody in a fair manner and apply the rules fairly across the board. Uh, I would also point out in this case that I think the legislation team did try to work with the member as much as possible to find a way to express those in terms of amendments. But the member has had an opportunity at least to make his point on the record. On that note, can we move on to stage three proceedings? And I would, could I ask that members have with them the bill, that is the bill, uh, SP Bill 38, the Marshall's list and the grouping of amendments. I just remind members that the division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes um, for the first division of the afternoon and there'll be a 30 second uh, vote at that stage. Thereafter, uh, there'll be a one minute um, pause for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in any uh, debate on any group of amendments, I should say, should press the request to speak button as soon as I call the group. So we turn now to the marshalled list of amendments. And group one is on the effect of section one on parental responsibilities. Can I call amendment two in the name of Oliver Mandel, grouped with amendment three, Oliver Mandel to move amendment two and to speak to both amendments in the group? Thank you, presiding officer. I move amendment two in my name. Uh, both uh, amendment two and three are designed to be simple amendments uh, for the avoidance of doubt. That means they do not add uh, anything uh, new to the bill, but simply seek to clarify what's already on the face of it. Uh, they were intended within the narrow scope of the bill uh, to try and provide some reassurance to parents uh, and address some of the concerns uh, the committee heard during its deliberations of the bill. Uh, they're made in uh, good faith uh, by myself, as I wish uh, to uh, allow uh, the courts when uh, considering uh, cases uh, that come forward uh, under this legislation uh, to look at the best interest of the child. I'm confident uh, that uh, when they do so, uh, that will uh, remove uh, some doubt, particularly around issues of restraint uh, and uh, some other uh, similar circumstances, which can be very complicated in practice uh, to, to deliberate on, because often uh, there's a fine line between what could appear uh, like physical punishment uh, to some, uh, but might well be appropriate uh, in uh, very limited uh, circumstances when exercised properly uh, by uh, caring parents uh, who uh, are acting uh, within the law. I, I also uh, draw out the distinction uh, of restraint specifically uh, and see uh, of uh, Amendment 2 uh, makes a uh, specific reference uh, to the exercise of uh, a parent's uh, lawful uh, rights and responsibilities. Um, and this is designed uh, to capture uh, those uh, duties uh, and uh, and, and responsibilities that are placed on parents already by legislation, uh, namely in uh, the 1995 Act. I don't intend uh, to say a great deal more, uh, given the fact these have already been debated uh, at uh, stage two. I move both amendments in my name. Thank you very much. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise uh, in opposition to these amendments. I cannot support them for a number of reasons. Firstly, Amendment 2 suggests, in part, if through interpretation, that there may be times when assault is justified if it's in that child's best interests. We aren't creating a new offence in this bill. We are amending... I will. Oliver Mundell. I, I, I just want to... Uh, clarify for Mr Hamilton, what I'm referring to is circumstances that exist in Scots law at the moment where an assault could be someone raising their voice, uh, putting someone in a state of fear or alarm. I would think both of those things can be acceptable for parents to rightfully do uh, under the law and I want to make clear that that's not what we're getting at in this bill. Alex Colehampton. And again, we will cover this when we talk about judgment and indeed the application of these policies by the judiciary. Uh, as I said, we aren't creating a new law, we are repealing an ancient defence, and it's a legal defence we've repealed before. Nowhere in statute or in common law have we felt the need to clarify that physical intervention or restraint of a hysterical and drowning man is not assault. It's just common sense. And as such, the application of this law will be met by the same test. Mm -hmm. 
Every day, our police make educated judgments about both child protection and criminal assault. We should not presume to tell them how to do that or where the thresholds for it lie. So I, we oppose Amendment 2. Amendment 3 further... Mon I, w I will. I, I wonder if Mr Hamilton would accept that in relation to the common law, uh, there's already significant case law uh, for, in, in, in relation to assault, and that uh, often informs how the police decide to judge things. In this case, there won't be. Article Hamilton. And I'm quite certain the judiciary will draw on that case law to that end. Mm. Amendment 3 further muddies the water as well. There, there is no lawful right to physically chastise only a defence. It also suggests uh, that there may be other kinds of justifiable assault beyond physical punishment. Um, I'm not entirely sure what these may be, but again, it leaves the act open into interpretation where we should, for once and for all, repeal this arcane and antiquated legal defence. We will not be supporting these amendments. Thank you. And Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. And can I take this chance to thank everyone involved in this campaign, which has lasted a number of years, but especially John Finney and his team for steering this bill through. From day one of taking evidence on this bill, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee were told time and time again by organisations and individuals such as the Law Society of Scotland and the Lord Advocate that removing the defence of justifiable assault would improve the clarity in the legal process. This amendment did come forward at stage two, and after lengthy discussion, Oliver Mundell told the committee he would look at the wording of the amendment, and he has done so by removing the lines to do with maintaining child safety and well-being and to prevent the child from committing a criminal offence. Now, President Officer, whilst I acknowledge that a change has been made, it does little to change the intention of the amendment. Children's Chart is most of whom are in the gallery today, and other organisations in Scotland, Bernardo's, Children First, the NSPCC, have urged members not to back this, stating that it would make the law relating to assault of a child unclear, the complete opposite of what the bill intends to do. And if this amendment was passed, it would essentially take away the central intent of the bill and essentially keep a right for parents to use what has been stated before as reasonable chastisement or a loving smack. Now, we talk about clarity, presiding officer, so let me be clear here. It is never in the best interests of a child to be hit, whether it's a light tap, a smack or anything else. And we've heard examples like, well, what if a child runs into the road? Or what if they're about to pull down a pan of boiling water, touch a fire or an open socket? But the method of teaching children through fear belongs in the dustbin of history when we fully, didn't fully understand the consequences to that child. Now, the other issue with this amendment is when you begin anything with the phrase for the avoidance of doubt, as the Children's Commissioner states, you create the impression that doubt exists and it doesn't, or at least it shouldn't. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has stated that Scotland should, put, should prohibit as a priority all corporal punishment in the family, including through the repeal of all legal defences. So I won't be supporting Amendment 2 or 3 as the... Indeed. Oliver Mundell. I understand the line of argument that the member's uh, progressing, but does she not recognise that the bill doesn't do all of those things? Gail Ross. Well, I have listened to all the evidence in the committee and I have read everything that we have had in from all the organisations, and I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with you. Um, it will take away the clarity sought and it will not result in the societal shift that we are aiming for through the bill. Presiding officer, I told my nine-year-old son this morning that we were doing this today over Skype and his response was, I am proud of you, Mum, but I thought it was already against the law to hit people. The young people of Scotland are watching us here today and I will be immensely proud to vote to align children's rights with adults at decision time by voting for this welcome and much needed bill. Minister Marita. Presiding officer, I'm grateful to the committee for its careful scrutiny of this bill and for taking evidence from a wide range of stakeholders, both those for and against the removal of the defence. I'll discuss amendments two and three separately as they raise different issues. The Scottish Government cannot support amendment two. Firstly, this purports to establish that the removal of the defence won't affect the ability of a parent or carer to act in the best interests of the child. Who is to decide whether the actions of a parent or carers 
are in the best, child's best interests. Oliver Mundell. I, I, I would have said it was uh, for the courts uh, or uh, police or prosecutors to decide what was in the best interest of the child with the purpose of the offence, which is the same as how the whole bill is drafted. Minister. So I would argue that the amendment isn't clear whether it's the parents or the courts who are to decide. What if a parent or carer decides that physically punishing the child is in the child's best interests? This is fundamentally at odds with the purpose of this bill, already agreed by the Parliament at stage one, one moment, which is the purpose of this bill is to give children equal protection from assault with zero qualifications. I'll take your intervention. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for giving way. I think uh, that this bill fails to recognise the distinctions that already exist between children and adults in many aspects of the law. And I would say uh, that it is appropriate for parents to make a judgment of what's in the best interests of their child. That should be the first thing that happens. And where they take that decision and it's incorrect, that's when I think police and prosecutors should set in. And I think this makes that principle very clear. Minister. The Scottish Government believes that parents should not be allowed to assault their children. It seems that the member is of a different view. The amendment purports to establish that the removal of the defence won't affect the ability of a parent or carer to restrain a child, either to keep them safe or to prevent them from coming to harm. The removal of... Certainly. Liz Smith. What circumstances, Minister, is a parent allowed to assault their child under current law? Minister. There is a defence there of reasonable chastisement. <laughs> we plan to remove that. That is when that is used on the occasions when a parent assaults their child. That defence can currently be used. We intend to remove that today. The removal of the defence does not impact on the ability of a parent to use restraint to prevent their child from coming to harm. At its heart, restraint is an act of protection. Physical punishment is an act of discipline. They are fundamentally different, certainly. Under the legislation as drafted, who will decide what the difference is between restraint uh, and uh, physical punishment? Who will make that judgment? Minister. So, as is the case for any report of assault, the police will investigate it and the Crown Office and Prosecutor Procurator Fiscal Service will make a decision, but they did note in their written evidence on this bill that the use of physical force to remove a child from danger, such as pushing the child out of the way of an oncoming car, would lack criminal intent and would not, for that reason, constitute an assault. I think I'd like to make some progress. We do not agree that physical punishment is required to protect children from harm. We conclude that the bill as drafted will not change a parent's or carer's ability to restrain a child to keep him or her from harm. In line with this, we consider the element of the amendment to be unnecessary, certainly. Joanne Lamont. says that across the chamber, people are committed to children being equally safe but our children are not equally safe under the current law. And therefore, I was astonished to see that in the financial memorandum, it says this bill, it's not anticipated this bill would incur significant costs to implement. Can I ask a commitment from the Minister that there's a proper understanding of how vulnerable some of our children are, and despite their parents actually breaking the law as it currently stands, are left in the homes neglected and not nurtured? That supporting these children cannot be done without adequate resource. So can I get a commitment from the Minister, regardless of what this individual bit of legislation says, if the intent of the bill is to keep our children safe, what resources will go into our communities in order that that happens for all of our children? That's an important point, although it's not specifically to the amendment. I'll allow the Minister to respond. I can absolutely assure everyone in this chamber and all the people in Scotland that the safety, security and well-being of the children of Scotland is paramount for this government. 
Sir, Skull Hamilton. I'm very grateful. Does the Minister recognise, as I do, that uh, in Ireland, where Gillian Van Turnhout, former Irish Senator, who is in the gallery today, brought this legislation through the Doyle, that at that point there was no financial memorandum because it was an amendment to another bill. Um, it passed unanimously in the Doyle. It, it has led to children being protected and is not mutually exclusive from a government initiative to drive up positive parenting in our country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Minister. For once, I agree with Mr. Cole <laughs> Hamilton. Break out of consensus. What a loving, loving. Finally, the amendment purports to provide that the removal of the defence will not stop a parent from exercising their parental responsibilities and rights. Section 1 and 2 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 clearly set out what these responsibilities and rights are, including the responsibility to safeguard and promote the child's health, development and welfare, and the right to control, direct or guide appropriately the child's upbringing. This strand of the amendment uh, seems to be an attempt to create an exception to the removal of the defence so that a parent could say that they physically punished their child because they did so in an exercise of their right to control the child's upbringing. Fundamentally, again, this is at odds with what Parliament has already agreed to provide children with equal protection from assault. This would muddy the waters. We have frequently heard throughout this bill's progress through Parliament that it will bring clarity to the law. This amendment would take that welcome clarity away, again leaving parents unclear about the law. Parental responsibilities relate to a child's health and well-being. The evidence is clear that physical punishment can have long-term negative outcomes on a child. Retaining the ability to physically punish children or even just creating doubt about whether this is permissible is at odds with the evidence. Turning to Amendment 3, the Scottish Government does not support this amendment. Section 1.1 of the Bill is clear. It abolishes the rule of law that the physical punishment of a child in the exercise of a parental right or right derived from having charge or care of a child is justifiable and is therefore not an assault. This does not affect other parental responsibilities and rights as set out in the Children's Scotland Act 95. The member has said, and we agree, that the offence of assault is wide. However, we are also mindful that, as the Lord Advocate said when he gave oral evidence, the law of assault is applied day and daily by police officers and prosecutors. The law on assault is clear and is regularly used. There is no need for an amendment that seeks to avoid doubt where there is none to begin with. Section 1.1 is clear. It is about physical punishment, as that is what the defence of reasonable chastisement is about. So the amendment would clarify nothing. The parental responsibilities and rights in the 1995 Act are not otherwise affected by this bill. What this amendment would do is add doubt, not clarity. Questions might... Certainly. Tompkins. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister for being patient with the number of interventions she, she's given. Th thank you to her. Um, I agree with what the Minister has said about clarity in the criminal law. I agree with what Gail Ross said earlier in this debate about the um, fundamental importance of clarity in the criminal law. Uh, the policy objectives of this bill, as stated in the policy memorandum attached to it, are in paragraph 4, and I quote, the aim of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill is to help bring an end to the physical punishment of children, unquote. The stage one report of the uh, committee says, again, paragraph four, the bill's purpose is to discourage the use of physical punishment. Not my words, but the words of the committee and of the policy memorandum. And the amendment that we're talking about, amendment three in the name of my colleague, Oliver Mandel, says, for the avoidance of doubt, this section applies only with regard to physical punishment. How is that stirring up, how is that muddying the waters? How is that doing anything other than bringing welcome clarity to an element of this bill which is at the moment anything yeah. but clear. Minister. We want equal protection for children and adults, and the bill achieves this by removing the reasonable chastisement defence. We think this is the right outcome. Is the Let's member 
Is the member suggesting that parents should have the right to raise a hand to their child so that the child thinks that there is physical injury imminent? An adult doing that to a member of the public could, depending on the exact facts and circumstances, be committing assault. I can see no good reason why it would be acceptable for a parent to do that to her, their child. No child should fear physical injury at the hands of a parent, certainly. Oliver Mundell. I, and that's exactly what my amendment seeks to do because it's about physical punishment. I think there's a number of actions a parent could take that wouldn't be appropriate for me to do to another adult, uh, confiscating a mobile phone, uh, restricting their access to finance, refusing to let them out of the house, uh, and in some cases, uh, lifting, a li li lifting a person up and physically removing them from one setting into another. All of those things could be uh, considered to be a form of assault or abuse uh, when conducted between one adult and another, but wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, inappropriate for a parent. Minister. <laughs> I disagree profoundly. I think that what this bill does is bring simplicity and clarity to a situation which is currently confused and it appears that the Law Society of Scotland also agree with that view. As the current law stands, certainly. Johnson. Just in the interest of clarity, can the Minister tell us whether or not she thinks it's acceptable to lift an adult and place them in another room and whether she thinks it's unacceptable to do that to a child? I think it's an important clarification that Oliver Mundell requested. Minister. So, I, I think I am going to just ignore that point and move on. I think the law, I think the law of assault is crystal clear. I think the law of assault is prosecuted day in, day out, perfectly clearly in Scotland. I have no concerns about the current law of assault. What the Law Society of Scotland say is that as the current law stands, there is a lack of clarity for the public about what parents and others can and cannot do by way of physical punishment of children. This has led to confusion amongst parents and carers. They support the bill because they think it will provide much needed clarity. We have heard repeatedly throughout the progress of this bill that it will bring clarity to the law. I cannot welcome an amendment that would lead to confusion. We do not want the effect of this bill to be that parents continue to have doubt on what is and what is not acceptable. I urge members to reject these amendments. And to call on John Finney. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. As with those stage two amendments, I, I don't accept that there's any doubt to address the provisions liable to do more harm than good. Adding an additional material could cause difficulties in interpretation and hamper the ability of the relevant authorities from exercising appropriate judgment. Judgment that others say is, is applied on a daily basis. And we heard very clearly, as did Mr Mundell, uh, present at the, the committee, to hear the Lord Advocate, the police and social work all say that this simple proposal brings much needed clarity. It's, it's hard to see how you could apply the additional tests set out in the amendment in a consistent manner, given how vague and subjective there are. There was a deliberate policy choice not to include statute, specific statutory provision on circumstances in which force, rather than physical punishment against a child, would be permissible. Although consideration was given to the inclusion of such a provision, the view was taken that the better approach would be for the common law of assault to apply. As it, uh, as it would in relation to adults, of course. Oliver Mundell. I, I understand the, points make, the point the member is making and that it was a deliberate decision, but does uh, he accept that there are other people who take a different view uh, and not just uh, those uh, who oppose the bill, uh, like myself, but Professor Andrew Tuchel, uh, who set out in detail in the National, uh, in a column, uh, why he felt it would have been better to uh, create a specific offence with clearly uh, set out uh, thresholds uh, so parents knew when the law applied. John Finney. 
Well, uh, an interesting choice. I have to say, I, I would defer uh, to the Lord Advocate in matters of law um, in general. Um, so, uh, there's risk inherent in this clarifactory approach that seems to be attempted in Amendment 2. By setting out matters in statute in this way, there's a risk of loopholes being created of dubiety as to the reach of any matter listed in statute in this way. And the most important factor that a number of, if, uh, and, and would indeed address my, my colleague uh, Daniel Johnson's position, under the common law of assault, criminal intent is an essential element of the offence. You know, and lifting a child from one room to another would certainly, uh, to my mind, wouldn't fall into that. Uh, the use of fo force to avoid accident or injury, as others have said, indeed, of an adult, would not ordinarily amount to assault, provided that excessive force was, was, wasn't used. In any case, the key point is that none of these act act, uh, actions would constitute punishment, and it is only the law relating to the physical punishment of a child that is changed by the bill. Evidence at stage one and two from the Lord Advocate, the Crown Office Procurator, Fiscal Safety, the Law Society of Scotland, Police and uh, Social Work, all stated that the bill, as drafted, would simplify the legal position. The amendment is likely to have the reverse effect of that intended. That is, it will introduce doubt rather than dispel doubt. In terms of A, this would change the purpose of the bill as a parent could consider physical punishment to be in the child's best interest. It would also introduce confusion and subjectivity as there is no objective test of what is in the child's best interest. The committee heard that prosecutors will continue to consider the best interest of a child as part of the public interest test and that the relevant matters are already included in the prosecution code as matters that would be taken into account when investigating and prosecuting any case of assault. Of course. Oliver Mundell. If, if the member accepts that the best interests of the child are already considered as part of the public interest test, why does he have such a strong objection to having that test on the face of the bill? John Finney. Well, um, I, I've already explained to the member that Lord Advocate said that the simplicity of this bill, the simplicity of this bill, uh, well, it is the answer, Mr. Mundell. You might not like, uh, like the answer, but it is indeed the answer. It's the simplicity that's the attraction. In any case, what you're seeking as regards the child's interest is an intrinsic part of Scots law and indeed the way that all our public bodies discharge their obligations. In terms of two, the amendments are necessary. Restraining a child to protect it from harm is something quite distinct from physical punishment. There's no overlap, so there should be no doubt uh, um, about the implications uh, f f of the, for restraint uh, at all. The issues of permissible physical restraint of, a ch of children, apparently in connection with their safety and preventing harm, is not the focus of the bill, which is dealing with the use of force against a child in punishment. The bill only legislates in relation to physical punishment, so has no implications for situations that don't involve punishment, e.g. where physical hurt is caused to a child in order to protect them from greater immediate harm. In terms of C, it begs the question, uh, by protecting only the exercise of lawful, quote, parental rights and responsibilities. Under the current law, smacking a child can count as, as, as such as a lawful ex an exercise. The point of the bill is to change that so that smacking a child as punishment can never be lawful. So as soon as the bill becomes law, and I hope it does, paragraph uh, C no longer has any application and so becomes unnecessary by virtue of its own wording. Um, so, turning to Amendment 3, as with Amendment 2, I don't accept there's any doubt. It's clear from the bill that it only changes the law in relation to physical punishment and not more generally. So, there's no need for this amendment. The amendment would uh, therefore likely create uncertainty, doubt and confusion, rather than remove... Yes, indeed. Oliver Mundell. I, th I thank the member. He's been very, very generous and patient. Um, can I ask, in terms of the rule of law that's referred to in Section 1, uh, does it only apply to physical punishment? John the, the member repeated and can I ask the member whether he can clarify whether the rule of law uh, that's mentioned in section one only applies to physical punishment? John Finney. The rule of law applies all the time. You've heard from the Lord Advocate. Oliver Mundell. I, I meant the specific rule of law around reasonable chastisement and, and justifiable assault. Do they only apply to physical actions at present in Scots law? John Finney. Mr Mundell knows what the definition of assault is. He knows that the, the, the discretion... Well, that's the answer you're getting, Mr. Mandel. Again, you might not like it, but that's the answer you're getting. <laughs> the practitioners have all said the bill brings welcome clarity, and I would ask members to, to, to not support either amendment and have in their mind at all times the word clarity, the clarity that the practitioners in the legal profession believes this delivers. No. 
Can I ask Oliver Mundell to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? I thank you, Presiding Officer. I think we've had a fairly robust debate within the section, so I won't uh, take up uh, too much time. Uh, there are only a few points I'd quickly like to make, and that is that if we're going to uh, focus on uh, things being decided on the basis of intent after investigation, then sadly that means uh, that families will already uh, have been taken uh, to court, uh, been in contact with our criminal justice system before we get to uh, a definitive answer on that question. Yes, certainly. Alice Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the member for giving way, but that is a rather categorical statement that families will be subjected to the full force of the law before the, whether or not they committed criminal intent is discern, determined by a judge. These decisions are taken on a daily basis by attending police officers. It's absolute fallacy to suggest that we're going to have legions of parents march through the courts to test this legislation. Oliver Mundell. I I uh, un un understand uh, the point the member is trying to make, but I I'm afraid the way this legislation is drafted, he's not able to make that statement with any certainty yeah. uh, whatsoever, uh, because uh, I think, as most members would, I would expect legislation passed by this parliament will be enacted uh, by, by... Certainly. Mike Rumbles. Sorry, Mike Rumbles. Is your card in? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I th thank, the uh, member. Here, thank the member for taking my intervention. I hadn't meant, intended to intervene earlier on, but I have to say that on listening to this debate on these amendments, it's quite clear to me that the member objects to the bill. And all his amendments are doing are muddying the waters in the bill. Would it not be more honourable? Would it not be more honourable to withdraw the amendments before we get to a vote and make your objections to the bill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oliver Mundell. I, I, I thank the member uh, for his intervention. I, I, I don't accept that. Uh, and I certainly speak on behalf of more than just myself on these benches because there are members uh, of my party who would have liked to vote for a bill uh, this evening. Not, not all of us, uh, but uh, there are some. And as an opposition member in this parliament, I regularly uh, vote uh, against legislation at stage three, but vote for amendments and bring forward amendments to try and improve legislation. I want the legislation to be as good as possible because exactly. it embarrasses this whole parliament yeah, yeah. when yeah. substandard legislation is passed and we later see challenges uh, to that legislation in court. And I'm concerned uh, that because of the lack of adequate thresholds, as I'll cover uh, in my stage three speech, uh, that this will end up uh, being the subject uh, of, of question in the future. And I think we should make clear that restraint is something uh, that is different, in our view, uh, than physical punishment. Because often, uh, when, you, when looking uh, at assault, uh, things that look one way uh, to a bystander can be quite different in the circumstances. And I don't think it's proportionate or appropriate to wait until further down uh, the line, once things are already going through the criminal uh, justice system to then decide whether or not an intent existed. Yeah, yeah. I think it's better to make those considerations up front, and that's what the amendment's about. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr. Mundell. So the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. I'm going to suspend Parliament for five minutes to summon members. There may not be many members who are not here, but I'll give them a chance. So suspension for five minutes to summon members to the Chamber for the vote.
Thank you, colleagues. That's our suspension over. So if members could take their seats for the vote. The question is that amendment to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Members may cast their votes now on amendment two. The result of the vote on Amendment 2 in the name of Oliver Mundell is yes, 47, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 3 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated? Oliver Mundell, to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a division. Members may vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment 3 in the name of Oliver Mundell is yes, 47, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We we'll turn now to the second group, which is prosecutorial, prosecutorial guidance on the Act. Can I call Amendment 1 in the name of Richard Lyle in a group of its own and Richard Lyle to move and speak to Amendment 1? Thank you, President Officer. I rise to speak to Amendment 1, my name, which has attracted the support of colleagues across the Chamber. Cross-party support for this amendment, I think, is a reflection of legitimate concerns shared by colleagues on all sides. Frankly, I share those concerns. Members will recall my rather forthright comments last time legis this legislation was discussed, and I must admit I am concerned. I am the father of two, the grandfather of three, shouldn't be four. I love them all to bits. However, I am aware that this bill has the backing of many colleagues and I accept the law is going to be changed in this regard at decision time. I accept in bringing forward this amendment, I simply want to ensure that the operation of the law continues to be proportionate in terms of its impact on families and children. Amendment 1 is very simple indeed. Established before the legislation comes into effect, the Lord Advocate must publish clear guidance for the courts and the police to help them navigate the new legal landscape and continue to deal with parents sensibly. I think that guidance should do th three things. First, it should set out very clearly what a proportionate and appropriate response to individual circumstances of a particular case. Secondly, it should outline the circumstances in which alternatives to prosecution should be considered. And third, it should outline appropriate pathways that should be considered as an alternative to prosecution. I don't think it's in anyone's interest for people to be treated harshly under the law. I think that in many, if not most cases, cases criminalisation be, would be a step too far. The effects of a police investigation, court appearances, prosecutions and families in these scenarios would be hugely, hugely dis disproportionate, especially for children involved. Criminalisation should be reserved for adults who have acted to harm a child, not for parents who are simply ill-informed. Ill-informed. Good guidance by Lord Advocate will avoid the scenario which has often been talked about where a parent who taps a, a child in the hand or a backside ends up with a criminal record. Tapping the hand will not be pro prosecuted under current law and reasonable chastisement under Section 51 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act. However, removing the defence will create ambiguity in the law which will lead to disparity in enforcement. In evidence to the Equality Committee, Michael Sheridan of the Scottish Law Society said under the proposed legislation, 
A parent could be guilty of an assault, even if acting reasonably. And the Lord Advocate himself has said that the impact of the proposed legislation in terms of prosecution is still unknown. The guidance out outlined by Amendment 1 would clear up any uncertainty and allay the public's fears. Amendment 1 reflects the approach to being taken by the Welsh Government, which is also, also wants to remove reasonable chastisement from the law in Wales. Deputy Minister Julie Morgan has said that the Welsh Government favours out-of-court disposals for parents who use mild just, uh, physical discipline due to following a change in the law in Wales. The Welsh Government aims to establish a bespoke diversion scheme which prevents parents being landed with a criminal record and the Welsh Assembly Children's Committee has called for a clear pathway to divert cases that would currently be captured under the defence of reasonable punishment away from the criminal justice system where appropriate and proportionate to do so. The Welsh Committee states that such a scheme would focus on encouraging and supporting parents rather than penalising them. I quite agree. It seems to me that the Welsh Government's approach is sensible. It's one that we should mirror here in Scotland in the interests of parents. Presiding officer, there are strong feelings on both sides in this debate, and I've witnessed it in the last 20, 30 minutes. But despite this, I don't think there is common ground between MSPs today, regardless of our individual. Sorry, despite this, I do think there is common ground between MSPs today, regardless of our individual views of party affiliation. I do not believe that any of us would like to see ordinary loving mums and dads criminalised. I don't. By supporting Amendment 1, You'll be putting a guarantee in the face of the bill that sensible and proportionate guidance will be produced ahead, ahead of a change in the law. Let's reassure parents that they will not face draconian punishments under a so-called smacking ban. Let's show them that we as politicians want to support them in bringing up their children. Thank you. I press. I press Amendment 1. Thank you, Mr Lyle. And uh, before calling the next speaker, we're just at the agreed time limit, so I'm going to exercise my power under Rule 9.8.4a to allow this debate to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid uh, the discussion being unreasonably curtailed. So can I call Alex Crowe Hamilton to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, the Liberal Democrats do not support this amendment, uh, quite simply because it's unnecessary. Um, in the 54 countries globally that have gone before us in terms of embracing equal protection for their children, they have not seen legions of parents criminalised or marched through the courts. In fact, in New Zealand, we only heard of eight prosecutions, four of which would have been prosecuted anyway since uh, they changed their law. Lord Advocate's guidance is only usually ever sought in special and untested circumstances. A good example of this would be the Lord Advocate's guidance not to prosecute victims of human trafficking who've been coerced into criminality, uh, into committing a criminal act by virtue of their status having been human uh, trafficked. But we are asking the Lord Advocate to guide judges on a range of measures and tests that they already apply every single day. I will. Oliver Mundell. I wonder, from the point he's making, uh, whether he recognises that the Lord Advocate has already said that he will produce guidance in relation to this bill and recognises some of the concerns that exist. Alex Cole Hamilton. Absolutely, and operationally he absolutely has every right to do that. But we do not require it, therefore, to be on the face of the bill as is proposed yes. by Amendment 1. We have recent cause, we have very recent cause, to trust the judgment of our Scottish judiciary. Judgment is also exercised by first the police and then the judiciary in a very human way every single day, ascertaining the intent of, uh, the, from the point of the index incident. And that often leads to an understanding of the circumstances around the alleged offence and a decision not to prosecute. This comes down to the very nexus of this bill. This, the hyperbole that surrounds the arguments against repealing the defence stem from the fact that they believe that we will have thousands upon thousands of normal loving parents march through the courts. The international evidence just does simply not stand that up. And for that reason, presiding officer, the Liberal Democrats cannot support it. Well, Oliver Mundell to be followed by Gil Ross. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm always concerned when people refer uh, to laws in other countries without recognising 
uh, that quite often those countries can have substantially different legal systems uh, with different uh, prosecution policy. And I think it is, uh, given that the Lord Advocate has uh, come to this Parliament and said that he will set out guidance in this case, I think it is perfectly appropriate for MSPs to set out what we feel that guidance ought to cover in order to make this law reasonably foreseeable for parents, to allow them the opportunity to properly understand the types of behaviour that we are seeking to criminalise, rather than uh, leaving that to, to be interpreted, particularly where no case law currently exists. I think uh, much of what Richard Lyle has said is very sensible. Uh, I wouldn't always uh, agree with him on everything, but in this case, I think it was a very measured uh, explanation behind this amendment. And if this was passed, I think it would go a long way to addressing the doubts of parents. It's all very well uh, to say that we have confidence in the prosecutorial uh, procedures in this country, but this uh, will help parents have confidence in the legislation that we are passing. And that's our responsibility to make sure that people in this country understand what the law of the land is and what our intentions are. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Um, we've already discussed this at length in the committee, and I think that we need to be really careful of the language that we're using here. It's not a smacking ban, it's the removal of a defence, and we need to be careful that we say that time and time again. Um, it was mentioned about the Law Society in their um, brief that they gave us for this debate today. They say, as the law currently stands, there is a lack of clarity for the public about what parents and others can and cannot do by the way of physical punishment of children. This has led to confusion amongst parents and carers. We support the aim of the bill to provide much needed clarity, and I don't think that they could make that any clearer. The difficulty with this amendment is that, well, sorry, I think you've had enough today. The, the, <laughs> This, this amendment would infringe the Lord Advocate's constitutional independence. We've discussed this at length at the committee. He's committed to producing guidance, and this is unnecessary. So, therefore, I will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you. And can I call Pauline McNeill? Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I just wanted to make a short contribution um, in favour of this amendment, which I think there was a carefully considered speech given by the member. I'm going to vote for this bill tonight, but I have always had some reservations about not giving a message to parents, as Dick Lyle has said, who are doing what they think is best for their children, uh, removing that defence, which is what we will do in law, but not criminalising those parents unnecessarily. Now, I think we need to be clear that in the amendment, it says Lord Advocate's guidance for prosecution. To Alec Cole Hamilton, it's got nothing to do with judges. It's for the prosecution's guidance. And I think it's important to make that distinction. Judges, once the case comes before them, will make a determination on what they think the law is. So what we're talking about here is guidance for the prosecution. I do accept Alec Cole Hamilton's point, uh, though, that uh, there are few occasions where you'd want to do it. In this case, I think what the Parliament wants to do in this bill is they want to send out a clear message to parents is this is the way in which I think the country wants to be progressive and give that message out. But I don't think in the process we want to parents who are actually doing a good job looking after their children. What harm would it do to put this into the legislation at the end of the day we can pass something which there's a bigger consensus on? Thank you. I call the Minister, Marie Todd. Presiding officer, I'm concerned about the implications of Amendment 1 for the Lord Advocate's independence. It is for the Lord Advocate to determine prosecutorial policy, to decide what guidance and guidelines he should issue to the police and to determine what should be published. This amendment would require the Lord Advocate to produce and to publish guidance. The Lord Advocate gave oral ed evidence to committee on the 6th of June this year. The Lord Advocate said then that if the bill is passed, 
he intends to issue Lord Advocate's guidelines to the Chief Constable of Police Scotland on the investigation and reporting of allegation of assaults by parents on children. The Lord Advocate added that those guidelines and prosecutorial policy will support a proportionate and appropriate response to the individual circumstances of particular cases. When appropriate, that response may include the use of informal response by the police, recorded police warnings, diversion, and other alternatives to prosecution. The Lord Advocate also said that the approach to prosecutions will be informed by the state's responsibility to protect children from harm and by consideration of the best interests of the child. So the member can be reassured that work is already in hand on guidelines to the police and on prosecutorial policy. It would not, though, be appropriate to place statutory obligations on the Lord Advocate, who acts entirely independently of government in these areas in relation to the production of prosecutorial guidance and guidelines. Be uh, interested in further clarity on, on, on why the Minister thinks that presents a problem and how this would interfere with the independence uh, of the application of that poli of prosecutorial policy. Minister. It is for the Lord Advocate to decide whether guidance and guidelines should or should not be published. That is part of his independence. In making that decision, I understand that he considers whether the publication of such guidance would be liable to prejudice the prevention or the detection of crime. There must be a... Certainly. I, I would just be specifically interested in what she feels... Uh, or, or, sorry, the Minister feels the Lord Advocate wouldn't be able to, to do that here and why she f uh, feels that he wouldn't be able to draft guidance that met that test. Minister. So let me be absolutely clear, it is up to the Lord Advocate to decide, but there must be a risk that the publication of guidance, which is intended to inform decision making by police and prosecutors, could be used as a guide to how to avoid prosecution or understood in a way which would tend to undermine the clarity which the Bill seeks to provide. And it is best to leave the judgment in that regard to the Lord Advocate. Placing statutory obligations in this bill on the Lord Advocate in relation to the preparation and publication of guidance could set an unwelcome precedent for other areas. I would be also concerned about some of the consequences of the member's amendment. Instead of the bill itself just stating the commencement date one year after royal assent, the main provisions would come into force on the later of one year after royal assent or when the Lord Advocate's guidance is published. It wouldn't be appropriate to have these provisions brought into force without a clear date being stated on the face of the bill or in commencement regulation. That would create needless uncertainty and make it harder for the public to find out whether the law is actually in force or not. And I am absolutely sure that that is not the member's intention. Presiding officer, stage three should be about solving any technical issues in bills, not creating new ones. In conclusion, given the need to protect the independence of the Lord Advocate in this area, the undertakings already provided by the Lord Advocate in relation to his intention to issue guidelines to the police and the uncertainties that the amendment might create, I ask Parliament to reject this amendment. Thank you, Minister. And I call on John Finney. Thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Can I first of all um, thank um, my friend and colleague Dick Lyle for coming to discuss the amendment with me in advance? Um, Mr Lyle and I had a, a lengthy discussion and, and I understand what motivates him to bring it forward and, and I, I share the concerns of the circumstances that him and his family had to, to suffer. I have to say, and, and as I did say at the time, that um, I don't think um, this 
w this would, uh, his, his amendment's going to, to help. He did talk about common ground. Of course, there's a lot of common ground. And I want to touch on some of the consensus about this, because I, I would hope to uh, allay some of his concerns. I'm afraid there's some geeky technical stuff in here, so I, I'm going to be reading it. But I, I wanted to say that um, um, I, I, I do understand where he's coming from. Um, this amendment would make the commencement of Section 1 conditional on the issuing of prosecutorial guidance. However, it could also give rise to uncertainty as to whether, on a particular date, Section 1 is in force or not. For a person to determine whether Section 1 was in force or not, they would need to ascertain not just whether guidance had been published by the Lord Advocate, but also whether the guidance had fulfilled the requirements of the amendment. This could well be disputed, and the amendment provides no means for that dispute to be resolved. So there would be no objective means for anyone to know whether the Section 1 was in force or not. The amendment also contains an inherent contradiction between issuing guidance on policy, which must be in general terms, while at the same time ensuring that it is appropriate to the, quote, individual circumstances of a particular case. The Lord Advocate cannot say what would be appropriate appropriate in every conceivable set of circumstances. Now, what we do know, and I, what I, I would hope uh, Mr. Lyle would take some reassurance from, at stage two, the lead committee heard from the Lord Advocate that the guidance will be prepared and issued to the Chief Constable. And I'll read what, it said, what he said. If the bill is passed, I intend to issue Lord Advocate's guidelines to the Chief Constable of Police Scotland on the investigation and reporting of allegations of assault by parents on children. Those guidelines and prosecutorial policy will support, a very important phrase, because it's a phrase that Mr. Lyle used, a proportionate and appropriate response, proportionate and appropriate, to the individual circumstances of particular cases. He went on to say, we're already in discussion with Police Scotland about the shape and parameters of guidelines. This is under active consideration. I certainly intend to issue guidelines as near as possible to the coming into force of the legislation. I issue guidelines to the Chief Constable, and it is then his responsibility to disseminate the instructions to his officers on the ground. I think very importantly, the Lord Advocate also set out details of the current policy available, uh, the uh, publicly available prosecu prosecution code, which contains comment on the public interest test and how the best interests of a child are central to decision making. Now we heard that in relation to contributions from both Police Scotland and social workers who are at the front line of dealing with these issues. So th the amendment therefore seems to be likely to cause confusion as to whether Section 1 was in force or not and add no value to the work that the Lord Advocate has already confirmed is underway. Um, I, I hope that provides some assurance to, to Mr Lyle. Uh, but were he to press his amendment, I would ask colleagues not to support it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Finney. And I call on Richard Lyle to uh, conclude and to press or withdraw his amendment. Today, during a school visit by Taylor High School, I was asked what I believe in. I believe in the rule of law. I believe I should stand up and share my concerns at each and every opportunity, and I should listen to sometimes, uh, to most of the time, sorry, most of the time, to my constituents who have emailed me sharing their concerns read this bill. And I believe I should be allowed to share those, those concerns. And can I thank every member in this chamber for listening to me and listening to my concerns for a change without a single interruption. Um, and I also thank, for John Finney, thank John Finney for the discussion that we had. And, um, you put in amendments and sometimes you, later on, you have a, a, a thought and a, a change and whatever. So, in regards to the Minister's comments, um, checking back, I believe that the Lord Advocate has now indicated and has indicated he'll begin discussions with Police Scotland, views pro uh, producing pr procedural guidance. And uh, it is a feature of our law that the police are not obliged to report every crime. They report the parameters that he lays down, and prosecutors are not obliged to prosecute every crime. So, due to this, these assurances, I will not now press my amendment, as I believe I have made the point for safeguarding and that I have made the point that, as far as I'm concerned, assurances have to be, so I'm not pressing the amendment. <laughs> President Officer.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Lyle, but I'm afraid at this stage you're going to have to seek permission to withdraw the amendment. Does any member object to the amendment being withdrawn? Yes. It does. So the amendment will be put to a vote. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. This is a one-minute division. The result of the vote on amendment number one in the name of Richard Lyle is yes, 47, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now that brings us to the end of consideration of amendments. Uh, I'm sorry to say to members that the debate in the amendment stage has gone 25 minutes over schedule. And I don't particularly want you to curtail the debate on this bill. So I'm minded to take a motion without notice to move decision time to 5.25. If Mr. Day would be willing to move such a motion. Thank you very much. So the question is that we move decision time to 5.25. To 5.25. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. Now, as members will also be aware, at this point in proceedings, I'm required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system or franchise for Scottish primary elections. In the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill does so. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority at stage three. So we're going to move on now to a debate on motion 18623 in the name of John Finney on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their buttons. And I call on John Finney to speak to and move the motion in his name. Thank you very much and indeed, President Officer, I am delighted to be opening today's debate on whether the Parliament passes my Member's Bill, the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. It has been a privilege to lead the work of many dedicated organisations and individuals, both within and out with Parliament, without whom this Bill would not have been possible. I would like to thank, and uh, in advance it is a lengthy list, I would like to thank the convener and members of the Equality and Human Rights Committee for their diligent and measured consideration of my bill displayed throughout the evidence sessions and at stage two of the bill. Special thanks also due to the clerking team and the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Thanks also to the many colleagues from all parties in the Parliament for their support and advice as my bill has progressed and for the tremendous assistance from those outside Parliament to Bernard of Scotland, NSPCC, Children First, and the Children and Young People, People's Commissioner's Office. I'm also grateful to the Scottish Government and their officials for their support of my bill, and to the Children's Minister for Marie Todd for her active and informed support. I'd also like to thank Nick Hawthorne of the Parliament's Non-Governmental Bill Unit, and Katrina McCallum from the Office of Solicitor to the Scottish Parliament for their tireless work. <coughs> Excuse me, finally, huge thanks also to Stephen Dane, my tireless office manager, long-suffering, eh, for leading the work in my office on this bill. Last week, eh, the leaders, an interim leader of all the Parliament's parties received a letter from the President of the Faculty of Public Health, Professor Maggie Ray. The letter was co-signed by, amongst others, representatives of the BMA Public Health Medicine Committee, the Royal College of General Practitioners in Scotland, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and its Edinburgh counterpart, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland and the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. The letter urged the party leaders to show their commitment to supporting the health and well-being of Scotland's children, specifically stating, and I quote, 
We want a Scotland where all Scotland and all children can thrive. We want to support and empower families to give their children the best start in life. We want to deliver this bill to stop the long-lasting consequences of violence against children in Scotland. Presiding officer, this is exactly why this bill was proposed to Parliament. For decades now, we've become increasingly aware of the long-term effects of physical punishment on children. The research is irrefutable. Professor Sir Michael Marmot of University College London, in the foreword to the report Equally Protected, published in 2015, stated, and I quote here, the international evidence could not be any clearer. Physical punishment has the potential to damage children and carries the risk of escalation into physical abuse. It is now time for action. He went on to say, on the issue of physical punishment, Scotland is out of step with Europe and increasingly the world. There's an urgent need for Scotland and the rest of the UK to comply with international human rights law and to prohibit all forms of physical punishment. Dr. Anya Hellman, one of the lead authors of the Equally Protected Report, told the Equalities and Human Rights Committee during stage one evidence, I quote, our report on the evidence on physical punishment shows very clearly that such punishment has the potential to harm children, that it is not effective as a parenting strategy because it tends to increase problem behaviour and children's socio-emotional difficulties. The committee heard plentiful evidence on the physical and emotional effects of the current permissive law on Scotland's children as they experience it. I would like to take some time to discuss the wider effects of the current law in Scotland. What does the law as it stands teach the youngest members of our society? Surely the answer is might is right. Imposing one's will on a child through the use of force teaches that that it's legitimate means of mandating a desired behaviour. When rational argument will not do, physical imposition of power legitimately prevails. Presiding officer, it's difficult to see how the aims of Equally Safe, the strategy to prevent violence against women and girls, which I'm sure every member in the chamber supports, can be achieved while there is a contradictory legal approach which says, on the one hand, there's a zero tolerance approach to violence in the home, yet an assault and a child may be subject to the legal defense of justifiability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Critics of this simple reform have often accused the bill of criminalizing parents. There is no evidence that a change to the law results in increased prosecutions in any of the more than 50 countries where some of the reforms have taken place. In fact, this change in the law in Ireland prompted more parents to contact services to ask for help and support with alternative disciplining techniques. Presiding officer, surely this is something which should be welcome an encouraging consequence of a positive legal change. In Scotland, we have many support services, both from within the government and in the third sectors, who, anticipating a similar reaction in Scotland to that in Ireland, where the bill to pass tonight, are ready to help parents from services such as Ready Steady Baby, Ready Steady Toddler, Our Health Visitors, and Parent Clubs to Parent Line, Child Line, and the One Parent Families Scotland Helpline. I'm grateful to all those involved in those ongoing preparations, the fruits of which will be harvested should members pass the bill this evening. It's very nearly, <coughs> excuse me, 30 years, November 20th is the 30th anniversary since the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was signed. Since then, states across the world have become required to protect children from all forms of violence. The UK has been repeatedly criticized for failing to take sufficient steps to comply with the requirements of UNCRC. My bill aims to bring Scotland into line with what appears to be the coming international standard in 57 countries, from the very first country in the world, Sweden in 1979, to Ireland in 2015, Nepal in 2018. The UK is now one of the very few European countries with no such protections. So I'm delighted that in Wales, Julie Morgan, AM, Deputy Minister of Health, who I had the great pleasure of meeting recently, is leading a bill um, um, following a long-standing campaign to give children equal protection. And that was supported at stage one by Welsh Labour, Liberal Democrat, Conservative and Plaid Cymru AMs. Since we had stage one debate of the bill, um, more countries have given legal effect to protect children from all forms of violence. And I hope this evening that Scotland can join South Africa, 
France in the Republic of Kosovo in doing so. I move the Parliament agrees the children equal protections from assault, Scotland Bill, be passed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Finney. And just before we proceed, as members will be aware, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish Parliament elections. In the case of this bill, in his view, no provision of the children, equal protection from Assault Scotland Bill, relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. So we will move on, and I now call on Marie Todd uh, for up to six minutes, please, Minister. Presiding officer, I'm delighted to be speaking today for the Scottish Government. I want to thank I uh, begin by thanking John Finney and his team for all of their efforts in progressing this bill. And I want to say to Mr Finney, who I know is planning to retire at the end of this term of Parliament, that the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to upholding and promoting the legacy he leaves in the Scottish legislative landscape in the form of this bill. I want to thank children's charities for their support of the bill and for the valuable insights they've provided during the parliamentary process. And I'd like to pay tribute to Gillian Van Turnout, who I know is here today. Ireland led the way in these islands in removing this defence, showing us how simple it was to equally protect children. This bill is supported by a wide range of bodies and individuals, the Faculty of Public Health, other health bodies, and bodies working for children jointly signed a letter on the 23rd of September, urging this parliament to support the bill today. There's support from many other bodies as well, including women's organizations and family law academics. The breadth of support for this bill clearly shows the importance of this bill. As the Minister for Children and Young People, I am committed to making Scotland the best place in the world for children to grow up. And that means placing children's rights at the heart of what we do so that we create a Scotland where children feel loved, safe and respected. The removal of the defence of reasonable chastisement will help ensure that this goal can be achieved. And this bill places Scotland in the vanguard of providing children with the same legal protection from assault within the UK. That's the kind of country I want my children to grow up in. The Scottish Government supports the removal of this defence. The very name, reasonable chastisement, is outdated and unconscionable. It suggests that it's sometimes acceptable to hit a child. That's at odds with the Scottish Government's aim of helping children to, feel, to grow up feeling safe. It's also at odds with the international evidence which shows that physical punishment of children is both harmful and ineffective. In line with international evidence, many countries have already changed their laws in ways appropriate to their own legal systems in this area. By removing the reasonable chastisement defence, we'll be providing children with the same legal protection from assault as adults. Why wouldn't we want this for our children? We'll also be ensuring that Scotland's approach is consistent with international treaties, best practices and human rights, and with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. As drafted, Section 2 of the Bill provides that the Scottish ministers must take such steps as they consider appropriate to promote public awareness and understanding about the effect of Section 1. Should this bill be enacted, we'll take forward this obligation, as well as considering what else might be needed for implementation. We acknowledge the importance of raising public awareness of the effect of the removal of the defence. That's why we formed an implementation group, which has already begun to consider what might be required to implement this bill, should it be enacted, including awareness raising amongst parents, children and organisations and resources. We will also, in line with the lead committee's comments at stage one, consider how we can effectively raise awareness in hard to reach communities and minority groups. 
When working with the third sector through universal and targeted support we provide to families and through the resources we make available, we promote positive parenting. We already have trusted channels of communication like the Parent Club website through which we can raise awareness about the bill and continue to promote positive parenting and provide practical tips and support for parents. As a parent myself, I understand only too well the unique challenges of parenting and I understand the value of having access to practical support in those high stress moments. So when we fulfil our obligation to raise awareness about the effect of this bill, we're not going to scold or cajole. As Liam Kerr said at stage two, our goal should be to help parents to provide the best environment for their children. The Scottish Government wholeheartedly endorses that goal. Finally, I want to talk about clarity. Throughout this bill's progress through Parliament, we have heard many times that this bill is going to bring much needed clarity to the law. This bill will make it absolutely clear that physical punishment of children is not acceptable. This clarity will help parents, carers and beyond. There will be certainty about what the law the is. The Minister is just closing. Parents will know what the position is and frontline workers who support parents will finally be able to provide clear and qualified advice in this area. In conclusion, presiding officer, I hope that we will vote today to remove this antiquated defence of reasonable chastisement from the law of Scotland. I commend this bill to Parliament. I call Oliver Mundell for five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As I stated during the Stage 1 debate and during Stage 2 considerations of the Bill, I believe violence against children is wrong. However, that's not the issue that's before us today. Today we're being asked to pass into primary legis law legislation that is imprecise and suboptimal. Yeah. It's yeah. presented by those who support the Bill uh, that the Bill before us today is the only option. In fact, we could have passed primary legislation that up front at the start said physical punishment of children is wrong. That's what some of the other countries that have been mentioned did. I think we could have made a very clear statement on that if that's what this parliament had wanted to do. Instead, we've decided to do half a job mm -hmm. and in doing so, I think we misdirect uh, our focus and we've passed legislation that could unnecessarily criminalise good parents and draw others needlessly into the criminal justice system, certainly. Alex Cole Hamilton. Very grateful to the member for giving way. Can I ask the member, if we had brought a bill to Parliament which up front said we will end physical punishment of children, would he have supported it? Oliver Mundell. I, I personally would have supported it, yes. Um, I, 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 th I think uh, it, the physical punishment of, of children for me, uh, I, I think uh, if with, with the right thresholds and safeguards, uh, it should... should uh, should be considered, and I've, I've said that uh, today in an interview. Uh, but I, I, I do also respect the right of parents uh, to make some of those choices for themselves, and that's why I think the threshold uh, for state intervention is very, very important, and it should be set high uh, for, for, for criminal intervention. It shouldn't just be a case that, that any uh, physical punishment is, is instantly uh, prosecuted, and that's what we're asking for uh, here and we're relying entirely on prosecutorial guidance to save parents uh, from uh, that intervention by the state. And I don't think that it is foreseeable uh, at all for parents what circumstances they could find themselves exactly. uh, entangled uh, with, with the criminal justice system. I think one person's uh, idea of what's the mild tap on the hand uh, or uh, a tap on, on their backside and someone else's could, could be quite different and we're only going to have that discussion at the end of the process. Yeah. When we've passed other legislation uh, to change the, the common law, uh, we've, when we've introduced uh, new offences, we've set out in detail uh, where we think uh, the law should, uh, should start and end. In this case, uh, we, we leave things uh, very widely open and I still haven't had a satisfactory answer, uh, certainly. Philip McGregor. I thank the member for taking that intervention. I just wonder what weight the member puts on the evidence we heard in committee, because as other members have said, we heard loads of evidence from lots of different organisations saying that those concerns that you're outlining will not come to fruition. So what weight do you put 
and all those countless number of agencies that came and spoke to us. Oliver Mundell. And I, I, I thank uh, the member for that in intervention, and I say this as gently as I can. I sat in this parliament uh, very recently uh, through the consideration of the named persons legislation, uh, where the deputy first minister who sat here uh, said to me he was confident uh, that we could come up with a draft legal code. We then find out uh, down the line that's not possible. I respect the views of organisations and I respect the principle uh, that they're fighting for, but we could have had a much more robust uh, piece of legislation uh, before us that was far less narrow in its intent. The uh, member who's bringing forward the bill uh, wasn't able to give me a clear answer earlier uh, on whether or not the rules of law uh, that this bill seeks to, to change, whether or not they just apply to physical uh, punishment or whether their scope is potentially broader. Uh, the Minister has not been able to say for certain in response to my point and that from Daniel Johnston, we are the start and end of our intention for uh, behaviour that should be seen as criminal is. We're asking the Lord Advocate to decide on individual cases uh, where, where, where uh, things should be prosecuted and where they shouldn't. We're, we should be taking responsibility, our responsibility as parliamentarians to set out clearly in primary legislation uh, where we think people should and should not be uh, the, caught within the gambit of, of the criminal law. I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, that this bill uh, is acceptable and I would refer members again uh, to the article from uh, Professor Tickell uh, because I think it does capture the point. I think too often in this parliament we like to make bold and grand statements yep. about what our uh, views are. We want to, uh, in this case, uh, pass moral judgment uh, on the behaviour of others and, and, and place uh, that behaviour uh, firmly within the criminal law. We can say we don't want to criminalise parents, but this law, as the Lord Advocate, as multiple uh, legal figures have said, creates a ca changes behaviour that is currently not criminal into a category of behaviour that is criminal. Yep. So therefore, uh, it does open up the possibility of prosecutions, certainly. Uh, no, I'm afraid you're just coming to an end. In fact, you have come to an yes. end, Mr <laughs> Mundell. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, before we move on further, can I remind all members that they should always speak through the chair, even when it's interventions. Please don't have conversations with each other, because I'm still here. <laughs> and I've got too thick, and I'm in a bad mood. So. <laughs> so there we go. And we now move on to Mary Fee for five minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I don't know if I want to speak now, given what you've yeah. just said about being in a bad mood and having too thick. Um, <laughs> Can I um, say at the um, outset of my um, contribution that I would like to thank John Finney for bringing forward this member's bill and for all the work that he has done on this issue. And can I also um, commit my support to this piece of legislation, which has been there since John Finney first introduced it, and also um, my party's support for this um, piece of legislation. And by passing this legislation today, Scotland will commit to protecting children from physical punishment. And that is an, an important step forward for children's rights. And as I said in the stage one debate, and I would like to emphasise again today, this parliament is a guarantor of human rights. And we, and every single one of us, has an obligation to protect the human rights of children. And the bill will help Scotland to meet part of its international human rights obligations under the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. And Labour is fully committed to the incorporation of the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law. And this bill is a step towards progressing that commitment. And the bill seeks to give equal protection from assault by prohibiting physical punishment of children by parents or by caregivers. And let me be clear, this bill is not about criminalising parents and carers. It's about giving children the same protection in the law that adults currently have. Any kind of assault is assault. It cannot be justified by saying it was reasonable to hit that person. If a person strikes another person, they are assaulting them. Evidence that we heard in committee demonstrated that physical punishment is harmful to children and is likely to lead to an increase in negative outcomes. Parents, children and family support services are best served by adopting methods that do not involve physical punishment. And this bill has often... Yes, certainly. Liam Kerr. 
But how does the member respond to uh, Adam Tomkins' point from earlier that the category assault is not necessarily limited to simply physical assault? Mary Fee. The member makes a point. Assault is assault. We, if we assault someone, we, we are committing a crime. There are, there, are varying, there are varying ranges of assault. We should not use force to control another individual. And that, that force could take many forms. The bill has often been described incorrectly as a smacking ban, but it's important to remember that this bill doesn't create a new criminal offence. Rather, it seeks to remove a legal defence to give children and adults the same legal protection from assault. This is a bill about equality and about respect for children's rights. And it gives the same rights and the same protections to children that we as adults have and enjoy. And I do understand the concerns that were raised by parents who argued that the bill could lead to an increase in criminalisation for parents. The bill does not make changes to policing or prosecution procedures or practice. Police Scotland said it would continue to take a view as to whether there was enough evidence to charge a person and the prosecution authorities would decide whether there was sufficient evidence to support a case. Indeed, international experience from countries that have already addressed the use of physical punishment suggests that prosecutions would not notably increase following the passing of this legislation. Ireland unanimously repealed its common law defence of reasonable chastisement in 2015. And Gillian Van Turnout, the former Irish senator who introduced the amendment that led to the prohibition of corporal punishment in Ireland, said that since the implementation of the law, Ireland had not seen a dramatic increase in prosecution of parents. And a key factor in the bill is its aim to facilitate a cultural change that will protect children from violence. And the public education strategy will seek to work in the same way as the ban on smoking in public places and legislation requiring the use of seatbelts, not to criminalise, but to encourage positive change. And the importance of this campaign, sorry, I'm, I'm almost finished, I do apologise. The importance of this campaign cannot be overemphasised. There needs to be a coordinated campaign message so that parents, caregivers, teachers and social workers are aware of the implications of the changes being made. And I do hope that this legislation will be backed with sufficient funds to raise public awareness for that change. Indeed, I hope that in giving equal protection from assault, we can focus on properly resourcing and supporting children that have experienced abuse. This bill does not give additional funding to help children and families where abuse occurs. And I sincerely hope that this can now be our focus so that every child can grow up in a safe and loving environment. And I would urge all of Parliament to vote in favour of this legislation at decision time tonight. <laughs> I call Alison Johnson for four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The law as it stands affords children less protection from physical assault than we adults benefit from. And that is quite simply wrong. My colleague, John Finney, seeks Parliament's support to change this today, to give equal protection to our youngest citizens. And I'm particularly proud to speak in support of my Green MSP colleague. I feel so strongly about the importance of this legislation that if Mr Finney had not taken it up, I would have sought to do so. Who could possibly disagree with Bernardo Scotland when they say that we want to see a society and a culture where no violence against children is acceptable? This bill is an important, it's part of an important change in our culture to one that champions non-violent ways of encouraging learning and behaviour change, and this change is long overdue. Article 19 of the United Nations mm -hmm. Convention on the Rights of the Child tells us that children have the right to be protected from being hurt or badly treated, and our current justifiable assault defence contravenes children's rights, and today we can change that. I want to live in a country where, where all children and young people know and understand their rights. I want our young people to know that these rights aren't just words alone, that they actually matter, that they can be realised. Human rights aren't a matter of opinion. This parliament, and Mary Fee focused on this, this parliament prides itself on Scotland's respect for human rights. But for every one of the 20 years that this parliament has existed, Scotland has been in breach of the UNCRC. 
Again, Article 19 is absolutely clear. It says, and I quote, states parties shall take all appropriate legislative measures to protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence. Yet the existing loophole in our law says that sometimes it's okay to use violence when disciplining our children. It is not, and we have been told that it is not repeatedly. In 2002, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child said that continuing to allow physical punishment was a serious violation of the dignity of the child and that it undermines educational measures to promote positive and non-violent discipline. No wonder then that the bill is supported by Police Scotland, by Social Work Scotland, by Children First, by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, by the NSPCC Bernardos, by the Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland, to name just a few. It is strongly supported by young people themselves. A pupil at school within my region wrote to me in support of the bill, as many did. On physical punishment, they said it hurts and could leave a mark or physically damage the child. Also, that it is very sore. They went on to say that people who are hit themselves think it's okay to hit each other. And no person would like that, would they? Before closing, I'd like to pay tribute to John Finney and his team. Um, I know from my own experience promoting a member's bill, particularly on a topic which attracts such public and media attention, it's a significant piece of work for the MSP and their staff, and John and his tireless office manager, Stephen Dane, have worked very hard to get the bill to this stage. And I'd like to thank everyone too who has worked with them. John, as we've heard, will step down from Parliament at the end of this session after a decade as an MSP, many more years as a police officer, and he's been a councillor too. And if the bill passes this evening, it will stand as testament to someone who has spent their career serving others and seeking to improve lives. Presiding officer, we can't allow the defence of justifiable assault to remain in our laws. If we are to create a Scotland which is truly the best place in the world, not only to grow up, but to flourish, we can't implicitly endorse the use of violence against children. Colleagues, we can change this today by voting for equal protection from assault for children. Thank you. Call Alex Cole Hamilton for four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming to the gallery Gillian Van Turnhout? So many dear friends and colleagues of the children's sector who I used to work with, but most importantly, can I welcome the many children in our gallery today? This bill is for them and those that follow them. Presiding Officer, this is a proud and emotional day for me. Today, a road I have walked for 20 years finally comes to an end. On that journey, I have stood shoulder to shoulder with some of the finest people I know, and I want to thank them each personally for their efforts. Efforts that have spanned nearly quarter of a century to bring about the act that we shall pass this evening. Three children's commissioners, a former Irish senator, and so many advocates within the children's sector. Each of them has played their part in this, and together they represent the vanguard of children's rights in our society. They will each be remembered for the change that they have achieved today. Together we have worked to support the architect of this bill. As a former police officer and repentant parent who used to smack his children, John Finney has lent wisdom, experience, and understanding of the journey that so many Scottish parents have been on in recognizing the harm caused by physical punishment. Thank you, John. This is not a big law. It's not even a big change. It simply removes an antiquated legal defense of justifiable assault on the grounds of reasonable punishment. Presiding officer, this is a legal defense that used to allow men to hit their wives and servants. That defense was removed long ago, and we would not dream of allowing it to be reinstated. As such, the case of its repeal in respect of children is unanswerable. Those who have to deal with assault and abuse both in our streets and in our homes made powerful representations to our committee. They told us that we shall forever fail in our efforts to end such brutality for as long as the state sanctions any kind of violence in the home. We have heard many arguments for the retention of physical punishment and this defence, but none have withstood the test of our committee's scrutiny or the evidence offered by the bill's supporters. 
Smacking is not an article of faith. It is not demanded by scripture. It does nothing to prevent children scolding themselves or running into traffic. Parents do not use its application consistently or always retain control when they do. And a light tap on the wrist or the bottom is not the full extent of every parent's intervention. That last point matters because, presiding officer, the only clarity offered in Scots law around physical punishment came by amendment in 2002. The sum total of statutory direction on this matter is no headshots, no use of implements, and no shaking. That's it. On everything else, our law is silent. But above all this lies the fundamental disparity of treatment between adults and children that this arcane defence creates. We would not for a minute consider relaxing the law around assault to allow the physical punishment of an adult with the mental age of three as a tool of correction or of protection. So why do we permit it for actual three-year-olds? To maintain this defence is to argue, I don't have time, to maintain this defence is to argue that it's only okay to assault someone in our society if they're smaller than you, if they haven't reached adulthood yet, and if they cannot hit you back. That is not compatible with our aims to be thought of as a human rights leader. It's not even compatible with our aims to be thought of as a civilised society. Today, presiding officer, Scotland joins a family of more enlightened nations, those countries who have recognised that the measure of a modern and progressive nation is in the rights it extends to its most vulnerable citizens and in the protection it offers its children. I will take great pride in voting for it tonight. Now move to the open debate, and we're really pushed for time, so strict up to four minutes, please. Ruth McGuire, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Presiding officer, this bill is about rights. Children have the right to protection from all forms of harm and physical violence. Children have the right to grow up in safe, nurturing environments which are free from violence. When anyone's human rights are denied, everyone's rights are undermined. And as things stand, without equal protection from assault, children's rights are not being realised. Because of their physical and mental immaturity, children are entitled to and require more, not less protection. The current legal position in Scotland must change. This bill, which I will be very proud to vote for this evening, is a simple one. By removing the defence of reasonable chastisement, it gives our children in Scotland the same protection from assault as adults. I take very seriously my party's aims to make Scotland the best place to grow up and our commitment to incorporating the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child into Scots law. Removing the defence of reasonable chastisement is consistent with this aim and commitment to human rights and international treaties. Most witnesses to our Equality and Human Rights Committee supported the idea that, realizing, that the realising of children's rights could not be fully achieved without taking legislative steps to remove the defence of reasonable chastisement. Scottish Child Law Centre stated that if Scotland is to meet its international standards of human rights and child's rights and to achieve its aim to be a nation which promotes the best possible start for children in life, then it's of crucial importance that any legal defence or justification for acts of violence against children are removed. I've done a lot of listening through the passage of this bill and I'm just going to share my thoughts for three minutes if that's okay. Internationally, the use of physical punishment is increasingly regarded as unacceptable. Presiding officer, I acknowledge the difficulty and the discomfort that this debate, that this proposition causes some people. Many of us grew up in very different times. Some of us may well have been scalped or smacked growing up. And yes, some of us might even have turned out all right. But taking action to improve things for children now and in the future is not a judgment on our parents or their parents or parents now who are doing their very best. But the inescapable fact is we know better now. Evidence shows physical punishment can cause long-term harm to children. It's associated with increased childhood aggression and antisocial behaviour, can be related to depressive symptoms and anxiety among children, and carries a serious risk of escalation into abuse. 
all things which not only impact a child at the time, but also can cause problems in later life. And even if it doesn't always, if it can cause harm, why on earth would we take the risk? In closing, presiding officer, I wish to personally thank um, my colleagues, all members of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, the ones who agree with me and the ones who don't, um, the parliamentary staff who so ably and diligently supported us, and all the many folk who shared their views, their opinions, their worries and their aspirations. If I may give a special mention to the children and young people in Portree High School and Boonskog Gaelic First Three, Moran Tang, Rashiv Jirach Skunyo. I aspire to a Scotland that is the best place in the world to grow up, a Scotland that protects and promotes human rights. So finally, can I just um, thank John Finney for bringing this bill and taking us a step closer to that place. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Daniel Johnson. Presiding officer, John Buchan, the Scottish politician, lawyer and novelist, in memory hold the door, recorded some of his personal recollections of people he had known, such as Lord Milner, who he described as being the last man suitable for a particular task. And I quote Buchan, he detested lies and diplomacy demands something less than the plain truth. One wonders what Lord Milner would have thought of current British politics. And Buchan continues, how often he would study a scheme of mine with knitted brows and lay it down with a smile. Very pretty, but it won't work. Apt words, perhaps, for the bill before us today, which has the word equal in its title, as if that made anything right. For the bill does no such thing. Rather, its effect is to enable increased state interference and destabilization in family life, to the detriment of children and criminalization of ordinary parents. Good intentions here or there, the actual effect is to open the road to prison for unsuspecting parents. I'm afraid that I have very little time to speak like others, so I, I can't take an intervention. I don't wish to aggravate the presiding officer's toothache further. Um, if I might um, move on, supporters of the bill have always said that the purpose of the bill was not to criminalize parents or increase prosecutions, but rather to bring us into line with other countries. But the bill does none of these things. That is why I presented amendments at stage two, all of which were in private decided by the drafting clerks to be inadmissible even an amendment which ensured the non-criminalization intention and an alternative requiring prosecutions within two years of any alleged offense. The types of protection guaranteed in almost all countries supporters of the bill rely upon. But Ruth McGuire's committee convener at stage two and the presiding officer at stage three have prevented those amendments coming forward to parliament. And apparently, we MSPs don't even deserve to be told the reasons for their decisions. Yeah. Now, if there had been proper scrutiny of the bill, if proper consultation, by which I mean the voices of ordinary people who contributed and experts, experts, note, who disagreed with the bill actually being listened to, if MSPs had been allowed to bring forward appropriate amendments, we might have been looking at a different bill today yep. which had wider and much more support. But we are not. It is as if none of the intermediate stages from the bill proposal at the start had ever happened at all. What we have seen in this bill procedure is a serious failing by this parliament. It has been undemocratic, it has not been transparent, and it is quite frankly a disgrace. It is this sort of conduct by current politicians that destroys public confidence. It is not pretty, it is not pretty at all, and it will not work. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too would like to begin by thanking John Finney for his tireless work 
in bringing this bill to Parliament. Because I do think it's important that this bill passes this evening because the law as it stands neither makes sense but most importantly it does not reflect the realities of parenting and bringing up children in 2019 because currently assault is illegal unless one is reasonably chastising a child. This is flawed if not absurd because how can it be right to allow defence for assault based on the category of person who is being assaulted, let alone those who we should be seeking to protect and nurture, namely our children. There is, of course, a reasonable need to discipline a child. Any responsible parent know this. But equally, how could discipline that requires causing pain to a child that would otherwise be considered assault if it was inflicted on an adult ever be considered reasonable? I do not think that it can, and therefore we need to remove this legal defence and provide equal protection to children from assault, as we do all other people in society. That's why I believe we should pass this bill at decision time. I will. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful to Daniel Johnson for taking the intervention. The member knows my view on the premise that he's just outlined, but does he not accept that the bill should be absolutely unambiguous and clear in its scope? Yeah. Daniel Johnson. I, I, I think in broad terms it, it is, um, but I do share some mild concerns, and I was going to come to this later on in the speech, because I do not think, as we debated the amendments, we necessarily covered ourselves in glory this afternoon, because I think there was a need for clarification in terms of the use of restraint. Now, in broad terms, I accept the, the points around intent and unreasonableness. I also accept that the courts and prosecutors, day in, day out, apply these sorts of tests. However, there are circumstances and examples, such as lifting a child out of the room, which if you were to have those exact same actions occur with an adult, I'm not sure I understand precisely the difference. In term, and I appreciate John Finney's clarification around criminal intent, but to simply lift an adult out of the room to calm them down, I think perhaps, at the very least perhaps, could be considered criminal intent because you are frustrating the intentions of that individual. Now, I just believe that that clarification could have been. And more importantly, I think it's for Parliament to test the law that we are seeking to pass. And I have to say, with respect to the Minister, I think it's with concern that, that she met some of those calls for clarification with a scoff and didn't answer them at all. Because ultimately, it is our duty to test the law. It is our duty to ask for distinctions and clarifications and therefore I think it is right that we ask for those and I think it's with regret that those were not met. But ultimately I think it is important that we pass the bill this evening in part because as a fun fundamental belief on my part as a parent that parenting you, you get what you, 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 you reap what you sow that in many ways that you, your behaviour is reflected by your children and you don't calm a child down by shouting at them. You don't resolve bad, by, bad behaviour by being unreasonable yourself. And you certainly don't teach a child that aggression is wrong by striking them. So for these simple reasons, I do believe that we should pass the bill. We do need to change the law. Because I think fundamentally that, that uh, physical discipline is counterproductive. But moreover, the society has changed and so must our law. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Um, when I stood up for the Stage 1 debate in this chamber a couple of months back, I said that it was a really simple bill for me to support, a no-brainer, and nothing has changed. I would like to start by, like others have done, thanking John Finney for his tireless work in this bill. And I'm very happy for him. As Alison Johnson mentioned, I know that um, I've seen his announcement on social media over the summer recess that he intends to stand down and what uh, an achievement that would be if we passed this bill tonight and credit to him and I'm personally very happy for him eh, in anticipation of his doing that. And I want to thank all the organisations also who have worked over many years to make it happen, Bernardo's Children's First, NSPCC, Children's Commissioner, Commissioner, Amnesty International and I'm sorry if I've missed any others who are in the gallery but the many organisations who have fought for, it, fought for this and got it to this stage. And again, for them, them, I hope that every member votes to pass this bill tonight. 
As Gail Ross said earlier, presiding officer, in the um, amendments part of the, the debate, if we're thinking about what almost all stakeholders tell, told us uh, during the committee stage, and they almost all told us the same thing, as MSPs, we've got a, responsi uh, a responsibility in how we respond to our constituents and the wider public when concerns are raised. The evidence continually told us, continually, I can't overemphasise that, that this bill will protect children's rights, it will bring equality and will not lead to the criminalisation of parents as it doesn't change the current child protection processes that are already in place. It, re it removes an outdated defence. It's our duty then to allay fears and concerns and we are in the privileged position, particularly those of us who are members of the committee, to have heard the evidence and take that forward. And, and I'd like to, to, to give an example of that and pay a true credit to my friend and colleague Richard Lyle, which we've seen democracy in action today, didn't we? An amendment uh, was brought forward. He had a response from the minister, from the member in charge, and he changed his mind. And that's what we should be doing with uh, ministers. And I hear somebody uh, laughing there, but that is, that is what is happening. We've seen democracy in action. And some of the fears that have been expressed, they're, they're, they're not justified, presiding officer. We've said this before. And indeed, I would go as far to say um, that they're only there to scaremonger. Um, you know, I, I, in the last debate, I mentioned my own social work experience, and I, I, and I would I, I would apply that again. You know, I, when I was working in social work, you know, there was always a measured response from agencies, whether that be the criminal justice agencies or the the, the care agencies. And that we heard from social work, we heard from the procurator fiscal and others that that won't change. Again, I repeat, this is not creating a new law. It's removing an outdated defence. I can't believe that anybody would think that we shouldn't be doing that. A defence that we couldn't even get figures on how often it has been used during committee. Folk just didn't know. Folk, it, people weren't thinking about it. This bill will make the law and processes clearer. That's what we heard was one of the main benefits of the law, and that's why the Tory amendments um, couldn't be supported earlier. One of, the, one of the most important things is that, we, that practitioners and parents have clarity around the law because, as others have said, there is, a, a, there is a lot there of people thinking, well, you know, is this not already illegal um, and, and, and that sort of thing. It's about, a, so, and some of the examples that were given, particularly by Oliver Mandel, about, you know, and I know Daniel Johnson put it in another way, and I was thinking about not saying this, because he actually put it in, in probably a better way, but, you know, the, the, the analogies of picking up a child and confiscating a mobile phone, this is quite simply about equal protection. The clues in the name of the bill, presiding officer, equal protection from assault. I'm asking the Tory benches to join us tonight in voting for it. Now move to the closing speeches. Now call Ian Gray for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, <coughs> President Officer. And as we come to the culmination of a, a great effort by John Finney in getting this bill to this very final stage, let me add my congratulations to him for uh, having done so. It must have seemed like a long road for him, uh, but for some of us, it really stretches all the way back to the earliest years of this parliament when we considered similar legislation uh, and on that occasion fell short of fully protecting our children, uh, keeping the compromise of reasonable chastisement, which we will, I fully expect, do away with in a few minutes. Uh, I think we can believe that parliament and indeed society has moved on since those days because those of us who were around uh, will remember what an angry, bitter and difficult debate that was then, in here and in the country. We spent time debating why it might be okay to hit a child with a slipper, but not a coat hanger. Though thankfully, even then, we concluded that neither was reasonable. And if that seems barbarous, then remember that this was only a few years on from a time when teachers routinely hit five-year-olds with a thick leather belt. Time moves on, thank goodness, uh, and so too does this Parliament. So this bill uh, has been, I think, a much more mature consideration of a basic principle that children should have the same protection from assault as adults do. There have been concerns around, of course, and perhaps that's why we have a Members' Bill before us this evening uh, rather than a Government one. But I think they have been uh, reasonably and fairly explored, I disagree, uh, with Mr Lindhurst's take uh, on that. And one part of that maturity of this parliament is our greater understanding of rights. And indeed, 
our desire to see our nation ever more shaped by those rights and respect for them. Uh, and a key aspect of that is the commitment mentioned uh, by many speakers this evening and shared by the Labour benches that we wish to see the UN Convention of Children's Rights incorporated in our legislation. Now, the UNCRC says that states shall take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational measures to protect the child from all forms of physical or mental violence. There is no ambiguity. Physical punishment breaches the convention. So if we wish to claim to be a rights respecting parliament, we must pass this law this evening. And I think that we will. But presiding officer, if we wish to claim that we truly respect the rights of children, this bill is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition. Mr. Mundell warned us against a liking for bold and grand statements. And I think he's right. Because as long as one in four children live in poverty in our country, as long as a child born to a poor family is three times more likely to die young, as long as 70,000 children need emergency food, food parcels, or 36,000 children are referred to mental health services in a single year, then to claim to be the best country in the world to grow up in is a rather vainglorious boast. We will end reasonable chastisement tonight, I'm sure, as we should have done so 20 years ago. And let's celebrate that and let's congratulate Mr. Finney. But while so many children still suffer unreasonable punishment just for the sin of being poor or vulnerable or sick or disabled, then we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too hard. I call Liz Smith for up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it should go without saying uh, that when this Parliament seeks to pass legislation, it should adhere to some key principles. The legislation should be clear and uncomplicated. It should be based on fairness and maximising the common good. It should be acceptable to the public who must see the legislation as both useful and beneficial. And as far as possible, it should be easily enforceable and not be open to constant debates about repeal. The Scottish Government, the Scottish Conservatives rather, have never taken issue with the good intentions of those promoting this bill. Indeed, there are some in my party who would have chosen to support it. But there are many of us in this chamber, not just on these benches, and indeed some who are absent today, who have grave reservations about what we have before us, because the bill does not meet the good legislation tests. As my colleague Adam Tompkins clearly set out during stage two debate, the fundamental failing of the bill is the wrongful classification of reasonable chastisement as assault. And throughout stage two, and again and throughout stage three, its proponents have not been able to address this fundamental failing. In fact, I actually find it rather disturbing the number of occasions throughout the passage of this bill where the very distinct definitions in law have not been wholly recognized. Now, Daniel Johnson and I will probably vote different ways this evening, but he makes a very important point about the need for clarity. And that clarity has not been forthcoming. Indeed, there are serious problems about the bill because it is weak and it has so many grey areas. It is still devoid of the conclusive evidence to prove that the legislation will make children safer. Indeed, the bill is severely weak in key areas about why the current law is not uh, acceptable because we have worked through this. Mr. Gray mentioned that we have been at this debate several times in the past. I well remember the debates when David McCletchie and, uh, um, and the, 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 in fact, I think most of the leaders actually in the party at the same time and uh, Jim Wallace himself made it very plain that some of the difficulties that the parliament faced about this legislation were for exactly the same reasons that are put to us uh, today and it is about what makes for good legislation because at the time one of the reasons why we didn't decide uh, to abolish the uh, reasonable chastisement defense was because we found that in law it was going to create so many difficulties and it's very clear from what has happened at stage two 
that we still have that problem. And my colleague um, Oliver Mundell has made very clear that there are issues for the Lord Advocate as he will have to seek to produce the necessary guidance uh, to accompany the legislation. That has not gone away. Now, my colleague uh, Gordon Lindhurst mentioned that there is a movement uh, away from the responsibilities of parents into what the state feels is better for families. And that is something that I think is a fundamental problem with this legislation, and it is something that has been rejected time and time again by parents. We've seen that in, in recent instances as well. I want, if you don't mind, uh, Mr Cole Hamilton. So when it comes down to the advice that we have been given by Police Scotland, the Law Society, the Scottish Children's Reporter, I fully acknowledge that they state that there is no intention to criminalise parents. I understand that. But what we have in this bill is exactly that because of the way that it has been drafted. There is an increased likelihood that we will have a criminalisation of parents. It may not be many, but there is that risk. And that is why this bill has got so many faults. And it's something that Police Scotland and social workers uh, have raised about the confusion that that can raise for parents because they are unsure about exactly where they stand. And Deputy Presiding Officer, can I finish my remarks on exactly that point? This Parliament should always be judged about what we uh, put forward as legislation. This legislation has so many faults that it is not acceptable and therefore we will not be supporting it on this side of the House. Thank you. Now call Marie Todd for up to five minutes, please, Minister. I'm grateful to members who've contributed today to this debate, and I wish to comment on some of the points that have been raised. Daniel jo Johnson um, raised the issue of restraint. That was wholly considered in committee, and the Stage 1 report was very clear that restraint to safeguard a child is not affected by the bill. He also asked me a specific question. Is lifting an adult from one setting and moving them to another assault? Well, the reality is it would depend on the facts and the circumstances. It could be justified and thus not criminal if, for example, it was self-defence. That defence will be equally available in relation to adults and children after this bill as it is now, but it will depend on the facts of the case. As I said in my opening speech, the Scottish Government supports the removal of reasonable chastisement defence because it's in the best interest of children. Members opposite have raised concerns that removing the defence will criminalise loving parents. The evidence from other countries that have made similar changes suggests that this simply will not be the case. Neither Ireland nor New Zealand, where the change in the law was handled in a similar way to this bill, has reported a significant number of convictions following changes in the law there. And the lead committee heard from the Lord Advocate that he intends to issue Lord Advocate's guidelines to the Chief Constable of Police Scotland on the investigation and reporting of allegations of assaults by parents on children. Those guidelines and prosecutorial policy will support a proportionate and appropriate response to the individual circumstances of particular cases. The Scottish Government recognises the key role of parents and carers in our society and aims to provide them with support in the very challenging and yet vital job that they do. And as part of that, in line with Section 2 of the Bill, we'll promote awareness and understanding of the removal of defence. We'll also continue to promote positive parenting and to provide support for families who need it. I think we've had enough interventions today, I'm afraid. I think I'll just make... Certainly. Michelle Ballantyne. In the financial memorandum that accompanies this bill, at uh, section 30, it talks about the fact that you wrote to say that in terms of marketing and, and making parents aware of this bill, that you were only seeking to use £20,000 and to it through a website. And yet in previous campaigns, you have considered it necessary to spend a lot more. Do you really think that is adequate for a bill like this? Uh, remember to always speak through the yes, chair, please. Sir. Marie Todd. Absolutely. We'll provide people with practical advice and information using existing channels, such as Parent Club, that people already trust and rely on. 
But awareness raising isn't just about families. We also know that public bodies like Social Work Scotland need to be involved along with third sector organisations. Our approach to awareness raising will involve consideration of the needs of professionals who provide support for families, like Social Work Scotland, and we'll work in partnership with the voluntary sector, children's organisations and others to raise awareness. There will be resource implications from raising awareness, but these will, of course, be driven by the form that awareness raising takes. Of course, we want awareness raising to take the most effective form possible. And that's just one of the reasons why we've set up an implementation group to consider what needs to be done should the bill be enacted. And that group met very recently, 23rd September in fact. And at that meeting, group members discussed awareness raising and monitoring the impact of the bill. The group will hold further meetings over the next year and will listen to the points raised about resources. The implementation group also includes bodies who deal with the implementation of criminal law, such as Police Scotland, the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service. It's been suggested here today that the law of assault is not clear and that the bill will create confusion rather than add clarity. I have to say bluntly that I do not agree with this. I will reiterate. As the Lord Advocate said about the law of assault, it is applied day and daily by police officers and prosecutors. There is not a problem with the clarity of the law. What the removal of the defence means is very clear. Parents and carers will no longer be able to use the reasonable chastisement defence. In conclusion, the government supports removing the defence. I look forward to voting for the bill and to providing children with equal protection from assault. I now call John Finney as member in charge to uh, wind up this debate. You take us to decision time at 5.25, please. Okay, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. And I'd like to thank members who have participated in the debate there. And I'm going to reflect on some of them. I'm sure members will understand and they wish to remain very positive. I'm not going to mention all the, the contributions. But the, the Minister, can I thank the Minister for our, our support? In fact, can I thank all members, uh, members for their, their, their kind personal remarks? Can I thank the, the, the Minister for her supportive comments and talking about the long-term goals that the, 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 the uh, government government has and the plans. Uh, and I'm aware of the implementation group and the work that's ongoing there. And I think our comments about the, the universal provision and the targeted support that is there is something that's very important. Uh, um, my colleague Mary Fee um, said, and I, I, I hope I noted her correctly, an important step forward for children's rights. And then highlighted the obligations placed on all of us regarding uh, this parliament's role as a guarantor of children's rights. Um, um, my Dear friend and colleague uh, Alison Johnson, um, who I'm very grateful for support, not just on this issue, but many issues, uh, also laid out um, some very interesting um, information, not least the contact she'd had from a young person and the concerns that a young person had said that will hopefully, are going to, at decision time, will be addressed. Um, Mr Cole Hamilton um, was one of the individuals who I was meaning to refer to. Uh, um, uh, there's many, many, but his long-standing commitment to this cause is to be recognised and applauded, and I'm very grateful for his support often um, throughout this process and his comments about wives and servants, I think, and uh, um, put this very much in context of the, how, how an anachronism this situation we find ourselves in. Ruth McGuire, um, children's rights are not being realised. Well, uh, we've, we've an opportunity to, to, to address that and again thank her and her committee for, for uh, all their, their, their hard work. Colleague Daniel Johnson uh, used the term flawed and absurd, and I think that is absolutely correct. And he also used the terms about protection and nurturing, and I think that should be key to our deliberations. Um, Fulton McGregor, um, and, and uh, we're always grateful uh, for his background in, in social work to, to understand when he talked about the measured response from agencies. And that won't change. Of course it won't change. Uh, we heard from the police and social work during stage two, nothing's going to change. The morning meeting that considers the uh, accusations that are made and the joint response that's going to take place will be exactly as it was before. Turning to um, 
Mr Gray, and I thought we, we, uh, Ian Gray there, we had some longer term reflections and I, I thought it was uh, very interesting he said that the, the previous deliberations had fallen short of the outcome and I think that's true uh, and that time moves on. And I think it's true to record, and certainly there'll be no uh, rejoicing that the job's done here. Much of what he said about poverty and the problems that our children face are absolutely true. This is not being addressed by this very modest measures in the bill, but of course there is an opportunity to, to do this. Uh, in the relatively short time I have left, uh, we would always call on uh, the, the advice of the Children's Commissioner, and he's, he's laid out to us a, a, a whole range of reasons why support should be given. Um, the bill plays an important role to ensure comprehensive legal protection from violence for all children. All children have an equal human right to respect for their dignity and physical integrity. Assaulting a child for the purpose of punishment should never be lawful. Legalised violence against a child in one contest risks a tolerance of violence against children generally. And as has been said by many, there's no such thing as a reasonable level of violence. And these standards have been set by the UN and the Council of Europe, and I think we want to aspire to meeting them. And we also, uh, the, the Commissioner talks about the overwhelming uh, expert evidence. Um, and we heard from many people during the debate about our obligations, <coughs> excuse me, to protect uh, children and recognise their particular vulnerabilities. Um, and and uh, uh, children are rights holders. I think that's something that I find quite unpleasant in, in some of the discussion, the idea that children don't have rights. It's absolutely the case that they have rights, and this is the place where these rights should be realised or guaranteed. Um, this is a lawmaking building, uh, uh, um, presiding officer, and uh, I, you know, I was reflecting what we're here for. We're think, here to make things better for our nation. Th this legislation is not a critique on how our parents brought us up or how we brought our children up. It's not a challenge to people's rights to hold differing views. We're here to make laws, we're here to scrutinise. Uh, and, and of course, that is about the scrutiny of our international obligations. We're here to make good laws that reflect uh, other aspirations regarding the lives that children lead in Scotland, to make good laws based on sound evidence and the overwhelming evidence supports uh, the bill, to make good laws based on sound evidence, to make things better. And this legislation meets all those criteria. It protects and nurtures, and I hope for Scotland's children's sake, you'll support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 19271 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out revisions to next week's business. And can I call on Graeme Day to move this motion? I move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I would just draw attention to this means a late decision time next Wednesday for a stage three. Um, no member has asked to speak in the motion. The question is that motion 19271 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. So we turn to decision time. There's one question today. The question is that motion 18623 in the name of John Finney on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill at stage three be agreed. And members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 18623 in the name of John Finney is yes, 84, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. That it uh, concludes decision time and I close this meeting.
well, it, it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thulis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.